Welcome, everyone, to uh, Wednesday, January uh, 17th, 2024. It's a reevaluation workshop, welcoming uh, Nick, our tax assessor. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, as part of the call to order, I show that the entire council is currently here and seated. Uh, Liam or Nick, do you want to start off? Thank you, Liam. So kind of you. Uh, I feel very alone here in some ways because I'm alone at a table, literally, but um, amongst uh, colleagues and uh, we're in this together. So as, as such, uh, I will allow for some time for Q and A's. Uh, you know, there's a couple points at which uh, I think it'll be make sense, but I'm happy to entertain those. So as was mentioned, uh, we're talking about the revaluation today. Uh, I put on the first slide that it's part two, because as you may be aware, on uh, September 20th, we had part one, and that's on the website if you want to review it. Uh, but we'll jump in here with just a brief outline of the type of topics that we'll discuss today. Um, I want to draw your attention to two particular things. Uh, at the very bottom of this slide, you'll see attachments. So in addition to the new material that's offered up tonight, I also wanted to uh, have first the communications timeline, which has been updated since the last time you saw it in December, and I will speak to that. And uh, we also have the first workshop material so you can see what was presented back in September. And then also I draw your attention to the fact that there's a little star, both uh, near the tax impact examples and at the bottom of the slide. I emailed counsel to this effect, but uh, let everyone else in on it. Um, I initially posted the presentation materials to the uh, calendar last Thursday, and uh, that was in the afternoon, Thursday evening. I went to a finance committee meeting and uh, was pleased to receive some commentary that had me thinking, uh, before I get to step two and three, I may want to have a 1.5 to clarify some of the things that I thought I had already said, but probably hadn't said 
in as many ways as I could to really get through to people. So I welcome that commentary and then uh, worked a little extra in the days thereafter to make sure that we could get an updated version. So any page on this uh, first portion that has a star at the bottom corner is just to denote that it's uh, new material in case you downloaded it on Thursday, it was uh, re-uploaded on early Monday. So uh, I will spend a little bit of time recapping what was discussed in September, um, both on and off in different slides. But if I had to boil it all down to one slide, this would be it. Um, what are the main points that I was hoping to get across? And the first one is, what is a revaluation? I think at the time of that presentation, my hope is that people at least knew it was happening because they got uh, a bill insert saying we are having one but that doesn't necessarily mean people know what it means or how it will impact them. So that was the primary goal. And you know, a key point from that, other than that it's to bring all properties up to market value, what you could approximately sell your house for. Uh, another key point would be that it's a revenue neutral process. And I'll speak more to the details of what that means again tonight. But the biggest takeaway is it doesn't generate any new dollars to the town. Uh, the budget is what does that. That's a different mechanism at the discretion of the council and voters alike. But the revaluation process being revenue neutral does not create new dollars that have to be raised. It just redistributes the pre-existing amount. Uh, then the second main point would be why now? And there are a couple of different reasons. Um, we said we would do it more often the last time, and this is the five-year mark where we said we would do it. That's important to follow through, of course, but much more important is that it, it is state law that we uh, comply with certain requirements. Uh, I will get to that on another slide, but it, the gist is the uh, assessment ratio to how your property is assessed to what it could sell for based on actual sales properties has to be within a certain range. And uh, within the next year, we will be out of compliance. So state law says we have to do a revaluation. Uh, and then uh, another key point from the last time, a recap, was what's, how's it going to be different from last time? In 2019, uh, there were workshops thereafter getting public commentary. And some of the takeaways were uh, we wish communication a bit better. We're really ramping that up. I heard a million times, even though I wasn't the assessor, I was a resident, the Massachusetts company uh, did that. Well, we're not having any company do it, let alone a Massachusetts company. We, the uh, Scarborough <coughs> assessing staff is doing it. And we're pleased to do it in-house because we're uh, very aware of the, the needs of the community, perhaps a lot more than an outside company would be. And we're proud to do that. And we also want people to know the project schedule. And if you had to boil it down to what was the purpose of all that, we want people to know in advance that this is happening and what it means for them. And we want to give them tools so they understand that impact. And we want to, to bring people to the Reval website content because however well I do in a half hour, an hour, it's not going to get everything across that a really interested person that wants to dig deep is going to have at their fingertips. But that's why we put more content on the website so people can dig a little deeper if they wish. So still on the recap uh, train here, um, to dig a little deeper into why, I had briefly mentioned this, but the specifics, um, we're audited by the state every year of how well our assessments compare to sale prices of properties. And there's a lot of sales in a given year, hundreds in fact, uh, especially of residential properties. And the state audits us on that and the audit for the previous year, because they're always uh, a year behind, uh, was 72%, meaning the assessed values were that much lower than the actual sale prices. And based on my projection for the audit materials I've already submitted, that they haven't uh, finished the audit yet for the most recent assessment date, April 1st, 23, it's trending to be 64%. And as I uh, outlined below, the state law requires that assessments be maintained between 70% and 110%. And I won't go as far to say um, that the state will mandate that because I have asked, but they did say uh, 
they're, the way they exercise uh, enforcing this law is by reducing the money they give towns, both to individual taxpayers, so they will reduce your homestead exemptions, so that hurts each homeowner, that's a resident, but it also, the state will reduce the monies they give the state of uh, the town and reimbursements and such, and do so more and more each year you're out of compliance and to what degree you're out of compliance. So, so that's the reason why assessed values typically are below market values? What you just explained, because the, the state wants to hang on to tax money? I mean, I would say no. I would say the reason why assessments are usually lower than uh, real market values are because the market often appreciates and assessed values, uh, you don't do a reval every year. So you're, you're bound to be behind the market appreciating. It's the term, the length of time between. Or how much the uh, market has appreciated, despite it only being five years since the last reval, the market locally and statewide has appreciated more than in other five-year periods. But the homestead ex exemption has been reduced or eliminated, right? I mean, it's just, been... just reduced locally because of our assessment ratio. And I can get to the specifics on that in another slide. So saying though nick that from the state's point of view if we don't keep up this process and keep it close to market value it looks to me like somewhere around 25 percent then the state says you don't get as much money from us that that, that's correct that? yeah so a real one of the benefits of doing it in a revenue neutral process is to make sure that we get all of the state taxes that we are due back in our pockets. That's, that's correct, yeah. That's what I'm underlining, thank you. Yeah, thank you for underlining. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just to reiterate some of those uh, dollar amounts that do change the more you fall out of compliance uh, or get closer to that level. Um, these are from the last presentation, so I won't read them all off, but you're welcome to read them yourselves about how much we've already missed out on last year, how much we will miss out on if we didn't do a reval this year, which we are. And then uh, just a very specific one, if any a resident homeowner looks at their tax bill last year, they can see that the uh, homestead exemption already was reduced last year, even though our audit results were from two years prior, we were still not at not only 100%, we weren't even at 90% in some ways. Uh, and I explained that more in the first presentation. Uh, so that went down to 23,500. If we were not to do a reval, it would go down again in the next consecutive years. But the state allows us, if we say we are performing a revaluation, here are our new numbers, they allow us to uh, certify back at the full level of reimbursements, which we plan to do. So Nick, <clears throat> yes. to, to Don's point, are these all the revenue impacts that if we don't do this, then our net budget is going to be higher in terms of what we would pass on to taxpayers because we're not getting the full revenue from these different. That's budgets. correct. And these aren't all of them. These are just some of the biggest ones. There are others. Next slide, please. So uh, transitioning from recap more to communication. Uh, as has been said, and I will continue to try to say, we're taking uh, communication very seriously in this revaluation process to improve upon the last one, and also because it's what Scarborough residents deserve and expect. Um, the first time the, this uh, communications timeline, I just put a small thumbnail of it here, was presented, it was via Tom's manager's report at a December meeting. And there was some commentary from counselors stating uh, that they liked the overall uh, enthusiasm of how much we're communicating, but they would have liked some clarity on a few issues. Uh, if you're only reading this, uh, what your takeaways are. So we, we did a little bit of that. And this is uh, a little bit larger version of the updated one, version two, if you will. But a full size version is on page 42 of this agenda materials, if you want to print it out later. Um, one thing that was said in the commentary among counselors was, uh, we wish, what are the messages that you want to get across? And uh, you can see I've circled on this version here, the word message. Uh, most of those uh, line items uh, above uh, the timeline itself were 
already um, there. So those aren't additive or changed in any way. It's more so that we call attention to the top above the timeline are the messages that we want to get across at each point in time. And the below the timeline are the channels through which we hope to get that information out to people, whether it be newsletters, uh, the leader, et cetera. And then uh, another big change was the box at the bottom, which if you go to the next slide, you can see a little better. It was key objectives. A comment uh, on, in the December meeting was, uh, what's the purpose of all this? And uh, this is what's listed here is almost verbatim of, of what Tom said as a quote, and I liked it so much that you know I summarized it into three points here. Uh, perhaps we thought it was obvious, but it's important to note that because it's obvious to me, a person who thinks about this every day, it doesn't mean it's obvious to everybody. And that's very important to know our audience and to tell them things that they need to know. So the key objectives in this whole communication plan in the first place is to pro provide public awareness around the fact that we are conducting this revaluation, explain the purpose and the need. So I already explained, especially the state requirements as such, and then to give residents the ample time, tools, and information so they can understand all that and then react to it because they are their best advocates on their behalf and there is time built in for them once the preliminary evaluations are put out there to discuss with me and my staff so they have the time to bring information to my attention before things are finalized. First of all, thank you uh, very much for taking these things into account. I think this is much better. It occurs to me when you're talking about channels and all the ways that you're going to communicate, I was asking myself, when am I most paying attention? When the valuation person shows up at my house. And so I would suggest to you that it might be worthwhile since somebody's going to be going out there to give them something to put in the resident's hand that explains all your good work. That's that brings up an interesting point uh, that I tried to get across in the first uh, workshop back in September. But a difference from the last 2019 reevaluation is that people are not going to your house unless you ask them to later on to prove that you don't have something we thought you had. Uh, that is a benefit of having one fairly recently, that that data is still accurate and good. And if we got it wrong, you, chances are you already told the town how we got it wrong. We fixed it since then. So the difference is we don't have to go out and measure and list as it's called your house nor go inside. It's far less intrusive. This one we are able to use statistics, the sales in the community and other data that I will get to. And it's far less intrusive on any homeowners. And uh, to your point of handing people something, uh, that's certainly a good idea. That's why you know we like to put everything in the, the bill insert. We could do that again in the next round. Uh, there'll be a lot of opportunities to give people things. And I, I like that as well. How are the properties selected that actually you know would be the ones that would have an influence on your home, say, you know, my house, a three Bay Street, or house would be three Bay Street, you know, we're not going to get, you know, uh, assessed or, or we'll have somebody come to the house, but there's a house nearby that's been selected that's going to be, you know, in, have an influence on, the, you know, our reval. How do you select those? It's a very objective process, uh, I'm glad to say, uh, because it's not my choice of selecting. It's based on all the properties that have been sold in the last two years. And there's quite a few, there's hundreds of those. And I can get into this a little later, but only if they're qualified sales, not if you sold it to your cousin or something, if, or um, you sold it to yourself into a trust. It, it's not those, it's arm's length market transactions that we use as the primary data source. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, once again, on communication, uh, not to belabor the point, but I, I do want it to be a two-way dialogue like we're having now. I want that with uh, residents as well, as much as they're willing, able, and desiring that same relationship. As such, I've uh, reached out to uh, various neighborhood groups, relevant local organizations, and uh, have set up some opportunities to meet with them. Um, I'm going to continue to do more of that. And uh, the, the intention is twofold. Uh, one is for me to offer opportunities to educate, uh, kind of like what we're doing in this workshop, 
but it, that's not where it ends. The whole two-way dialogue uh, is not just lip service. I, I literally want to know people's suggestions or concerns or questions as soon as possible proactively because I can incorporate them in my work. If people say last time this happened and it could have been avoided, are you gonna think about it this time? Thank you for telling me, yes, I will, now that I know. So I really value those opportunities. And although I've, to an extent, hand selected uh, my initial outreach to communities uh, or groups that I, I know exist and I know are interested in such things, that's not where it stops. I'm very uh, open to being reached out to as well, even if it's just by individuals, uh, I value that opportunity. And then, I'm sorry. yeah, of course. I know it says here neighborhood groups or so we'd be doing things like, you know, have a group at the fire state, the local fire station. That's certainly, that's, cer that's certainly possible. And I'm, uh, I would welcome any counselor's ideas for things uh, to that effect. Um, there's uh, large groups of town that have neighborhood associations, for example. Uh, there's groups that organize themselves around certain issues or the business community that has meetings already. If I say, can I go to that meeting and, you know, be part of it, that, that's my foot uh, in the door. Um, there's also already like community services, senior meetings. There's there's a lot of opportunities. I'm going to suggest North Scarborough Fire Station. Mm -hmm. That's where I am. We don't have any neighborhood associations mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever. So sure. just putting that on the list. Yeah, I'll <laughs> be in touch. All right. And then uh, in terms of the media, as was mentioned through the communication plan, uh, we're trying through all uh, ways we can to get through to people. Like with the community survey, different people digest their um, uh, material from the town in different mediums, whether it's the leader, the newsletter, meetings, other social media. So we're trying a little bit of everything in hopes that we'll get through to people word of mouth and otherwise. Um, to the my left uh, on this slide, the calculation of tax rate. So that was something from the initial presentation in September, but I wanted to do a few call outs here because sometimes just words um, around big concepts isn't as good as words and numbers. So I, I pointed out to a couple specific examples, the tax rate, for example, uh, without all the zeros, I uh, summarized it here. Fiscal year 24, so the current year we're in, that budget, the town budget, net budget, uh, was $82.12 million, town and school. And the town valuation of all taxable properties in town, which there are over 10,000, is 5.14 billion. Uh, and that's before the revaluation, that's their taxable assessed value. So that's why we have a tax rate of 0 0.01597. We often refer to the mill rate, quote unquote, which is the per thousand of it, because it's easier to say 1597 per thousand. In a recent conversation, uh, it was pointed out to me that uh, if you're looking at the 0 0.015, you could actually translate that to that's 1.5%. So 1.5 of your current assessed value is what you pay in taxes annually less any exemptions you receive. And uh, the revenue neutral call out uh, the one pointing to the example on the bottom right. If the budget were to remain the same, uh, just for a hypothetical example, that at $82.12 million, but the whole town uh, valuation went up $2 billion. I'm just using a round number. It's very large, but it's plausible. Um, the tax rate would go down significantly. So that's just to prove the point that um, it is revenue neutral meaning no new dollars need to be raised as a result of this is merely redistributing who plays what portion of that 82 million in this scenario. Now we all know the budget does increase year to year for various reasons, inflation alone would be one reason, but it's to prove the, the revaluation won't be the reason the budget increases. It may be uh, part of the reason your tax bill changes and we'll get to that. So these uh, next three slides are uh, reiterations from the uh, September um, presentation. So I won't go into them in too much depth, but I thought they were important in the fact that they do highlight if all the properties, uh, you know, 
go up on average, the whole town valuation by, let's say, 50%, another round number, uh, and your property goes up by exactly 50%, the revaluation would not affect your taxes. But I don't want people to feel misled when they hear revenue neutral that they mistake that for it will not affect my tax bill. It possibly will. It just won't add new money to the budget request. What could happen is if that scenario where the entire town-wide valuation goes up by 50% exactly, but your property goes up less than that, your taxes would decrease as a result of the revaluation. Then they might subsequently increase if the budget goes up. Uh, conversely, on number three, if your property goes up by 60% and the town as a whole went up by 50%, your taxes could increase just as a result of the revaluation. And the next two slides just give examples of that. So this is a, a more concrete $400,000 home uh, reassessed with a 40% a increase as potentially dictated by the sales of like properties, but the town only went up, or went up by 50%, which is more than that property, the taxes would likely decrease as a result of the revaluation. And then here's the opposite example. A different $400,000 home was proven to appreciate more than the town-wide average. So their taxes would likely increase as a result of the revaluation. So um, that was kind of the end of the, the recap. I went in and out of that between recap and communication. And uh, the, the next section I will get into uh, is based on my new additions and based on commentary from the finance committee meeting to give maybe a little bit more of kitchen table or back of the napkin examples, concrete numbers. But before I proceed, does anyone have any questions or commentary on what I've done so far or what I've said so far? Just, just in that scenario that you mentioned about how, you know, if, if you happen to be in a home, that's going to go up or down based on the total town valuation. What are, typically the drivers that are gonna impact that? Like, is it location? Can we anticipate if you're on the coastal side, people should just be prepared that it's more likely that their values are gonna go up at a greater rate. If it's new development, are those likely gonna go up? Like I live in a neighborhood where it was a, a we were in like phase one or two when the reval happened and now we're at phase five, so it's complete. Mm -hmm. And so my assumption going into this is the value of our community is greater um, as a result of that. So I'm anticipating that my particular neighborhood, just because it's a complete new development, will likely be rebound to be relatively higher than the rest of Scarborough. And so again, like what are what are the things that people should be aware of that are are going to be impacts that are going to impact their valuation overall? That's a good question. Um, so uh, overall, uh, the, mostly the answer to that question is it, it depends, you know, but that's never a, a good and complete answer. So what I mean by that is um, there's no specific factor uh, that would make a property increase more or less than another factor. It's a mix of all the factors combined and most importantly, what the sales market has shown. So if people, this is a very a basic example and not necessarily even something that's happened, all the more reason to just use it as a basic example. What if um, people lost uh, interest in uh, ranch homes and wanted colonial all of a sudden, and that wasn't the case five years ago, and now it, it has been for the last two years of the sales we're looking at, well, that would mean that style of home would go up more compared to the less desirable home. That's not something that's actually happened to my knowledge. So I, I felt comfortable using that, but that's an example of what could. Um, it's, I would say it's no particular part of town has to worry more or less than another. Although if the sales have been w much higher on average compared to other parts of town for similar properties, that may dictate the change, but I don't have it top of mind that a particular part of town would have to worry at this point. That said, uh, I'll get to this in later slides. One thing I do want to be transparent about, because it's been asked, uh, one of the more frequently asked questions, um, uh, the type and use of property, namely residential versus commercial industrial apartment. 
So residential, single family homes, condos, those types of things. Um, those have appreciated very greatly uh, statewide and nationwide. So people have asked, is there going to be a shift of the tax burden from commercial to residential more so? And uh, that's, that's a real concern. And I wanna be transparent that I do think that is likely to occur to some extent. Uh, I don't want to give uh, the illusion that I have the specific numbers at this time because uh, we're not at that point in the process yet. But the reason why I want to give people a heads up, it, it, there's a couple of reasons. One is um, uh, I've been taking some quotes from uh, uh, people that do email me the concerns that have already incorporated some of them without calling them out. And there, I'll remain anonymous to all of them. But one that I got was, um, if there's anything taxpayers hate worse than a large tax bill, it's a surprise large tax bill. And uh, surprises are not uh, something that I, I think people deserve or want. Um, so I wanna be transparent that that is possible that commercial properties maybe have not appreciated as much as residential properties. Um, to give some examples, uh, perhaps you were aware of the, the news of other towns, perhaps South Portland um, where Bangor had a similar thing, Portland. They all had revaluations in uh, past years, uh, and they all experienced that, that shift because, as a whole, commercial properties uh, in those communities did not go up as much as residential. So um, one thing that happened in some of those communities, I don't know the exact specifics, are it was almost as bad as commercial properties didn't increase at all, and residentials did a lot. So I'm not saying that's going to happen here, and I'm... I'm very pleased to relay that it's not to that extent. So, sorry, just can I follow up real quick on that? So we just celebrated last year that we had 25% of our taxable value coming from commercial. So are you saying that likely that proportion may shift downward potentially based on what's happening in the market? I, I would say that's quite likely. And uh, I do not have the numbers at this time, but um, the, the reason I, I do say it's likely uh, is because that's a trend uh, everywhere, nationwide, Maine. I have uh, professional cost indices and materials that tell me that is likely to occur. And the reason I don't know the exact numbers yet, and I, I wish I did for giving people the most advanced notice, is because uh, I have not completed the, the revaluation work. Uh, uh, specifically, I am not as far along in the commercial as the residential because there were so many residential properties. I prioritized getting that further along first, and I am quite far along in that. But also the commercial properties are only, uh, we're still awaiting some of the information. Uh, as of today, I mailed out uh, over 500 income and expense questionnaires. And uh, the information regarding that is on the town website revaluation pages as we speak. And I'll get to that later, assuming we have time to get that far into the presentation materials, but um, we won't get those materials, that information back, which is useful for part of the valuation of commercial properties until a month from now at worst. And then I will have to sift through that. So similarly to the timeline I've uh, told you to expect, uh, we won't have the final values until May. I follow up with a quick question on that. Yeah, of course. So you get a you have a, it's an actual apartment building, right? But you consider that commercial. That's correct, because it's income producing. So I can imagine that, I mean, we've built a lot of new commercial apartments or residential apartment buildings in town. How does that quote unquote reevaluation occur? If you, I would imagine the sales market's pretty like slow on that front. I mean, the number of apartment buildings that actually exchange ownership hands. So how do you how do you perform those evaluations? Yeah, that is uh, spoken to on later slides, but since you asked, I will speak to some of it now. Uh, the residential properties, um, I'll take a step back. There are three ways in which or approaches to valuing all properties that uh, assessors must consider. Those are the um, cost approach, the um, sales uh, comparison and market approach, uh, and then there's also the income approach. Uh, because there's less sales with commercial properties, it's great that we have the additional tool of 
the fact that they're income generating properties for the income approach. So with the residential properties, we test the cost tables in our system, which is one approach by all the sales analysis, which is uh, excellent data that we have a lot of confidence in because it's uh, two years worth of hundreds of sales to prove where those numbers should be. Because there's only tens of sales of unique commercial properties um, or any commercial properties in a given year, uh, we have the income approach. And I've got slides on this, like I said, but the, the gist is uh, one way to consider the value of a commercial property, including apartments, is that a potential investor really values the market value of that property, which is what we're trying to assess by how much money it could in, uh, generate for them in future cash flow. And there are assessing methodologies and standard forms and equations with which if we just know a few pieces of information, not just from specific owners, but the, the market in general, which we, there are many sources of that data, um, we can approximate value by seeing how much would an investor pay for this based on how much that property could earn in time. So that's how we get around the lack of sales. We use the income approach to test our cost approach versus residential. We use the sales to test our cost approach. So Nick, on a um, commercial residential apartment building, uh, which the rents are reflective of the demand for housing, which we all know was sort of <laughs> off the charts. Is it fair to say that even with that uh, valuation method, that we're still going to see a shift towards um, residential properties, which will then kind of pass through to rent to renters. So in other words, if I'm the landlord, you take an income approach to valuing the property, uh, you see what my um, <clears throat> income is, and then uh, you raise my taxes based on that. And then I turn around and shift it to my tenants. Is that fair? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know that that's true. I'm putting yeah, that I don't know that that's true either. And in, as my role as an assessor, um, it, it's not up to me what uh, landlords uh, choose to do. Um, so I can't uh, guess to that. But I, I would say that in, in that you know scenario of uh, statements, um, you, you're right that although in, we must consider apartments, uh, commercial properties in the state of Maine, because that's what the law dictates, mm -hmm. and they are income producing, people live in them. So there's a possible effect, but here's a hypothetical. What if apartments do go up more than other types of commercial, like a, a retail, that, that's what happened in South Portland, for example, like the mall properties didn't go up, but apartments did. So th there's different types of appreciation among commercial properties even. I'm just uh, putting out there with advance notice, uh, despite not having the exact numbers yet, that it is possible based on what I've seen in other communities and uh, industry data, that residential properties as a whole, so 75% of our current valuation could appreciate more than the other 25% commercial as a whole, despite different portions of the commercial uh, types of uses may appreciate more or less than each other. Nick, can you um, talk about cost to serve and the impact of cost to serve? Does that figure in? It doesn't factor not into. With the, not with the values of the assessing and maybe this is, because generally speaking, the cost to serve is higher for residential than it is for commercial. Yeah, you may be right. Um, okay, that, that's right. Um, Put it on that, you. That's a, that's a very <laughs> important factor to consider right. for budgetary reasons, right. but it's uh, right. separate and distinct from the revaluation and assessing process. Yeah, okay. It's not something I, I consider, yeah. and it's something that the finance committee and the budget process may. Yeah. And, and the only reason I ask that is because I know that, uh, you know, I know that there are people out there saying, oh, my God, you know, we do, we've do we done all this commercial and the yak, and now it's going down in value, and how's that going to help us? So I'm going to I'll let the finance yeah. committee at some point deal yeah. with that factor yeah. that. Well, Nick is coming to the next yeah. finance committee to kind of dig deeper. Okay. Right. And my ask would be, because I don't think we'll have time today. You did a good job kind of at the beginning saying how revenues could be impacted. I think yeah. we should also understand how the net budget and tax levy to, to residents could be impacted as a result. Like 
what expenses may go up as a result and or with this shift. So that way, as we're setting our goal, we know, I'm just making this up, like say $82 million is the budget right now. If this reval happened, maybe 84 million would have been what we would have had to levy because of other thing, other factors at play, which would have had a higher tax rate. So I just wanna make sure we're sensitive and understand the impact the reval will ultimately have. So that way when we're looking to make investments next year, we have that impact in our mind so that we're not going up 10% by making tiny investments because of the impact the reval could have on yeah. the tax levy. So I would just ask like to help the finance committee better understand that, especially as we go into setting goals for budget. Like I feel like we just need to understand that particular aspect. Yeah, I'm happy to come to those meetings and provide whatever I can for information. I just have one comment here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just trying to follow the bouncing ball, mm -hmm. you know, through this discussion is pretty challenging, even for people who spend a lot of time on it. So, you know, my, you know, you know, the thing that I struggle with is, uh, you know, we had expectations set, you know, um, um, due to s a certain commitments we made to, you know, large developments that it would, you know, increase the, you know, uh, the contribution uh, from, <clears throat> From commercial properties in terms of the tax base and shifted away from 80 percent residential you know and 20 percent commercial more in that direction so i mean i was you know everyone's doing handstands at the sedco presentation you know that we had in the fall and now we're finding well maybe it's not going to be that great so i just i i think it's gonna be very important for us to to be sober you know when we're when people are selling benefits like that and to be mindful of the fact that we don't really even have a full accounting, you know, of the costs and benefits today. We, we talk about cost to serve. We talk about things like the assessor's definition of commercial. There's so many puts and takes on these things. It's very complicated, even for the close followers to A, try to understand it and B, try to explain it to their neighbor. So, you know, I understand and appreciate the challenge that you have, but I, <clears throat> I think we have a lot more work to do as a council, as a finance committee, as a, you know, town manager and staff to really be honest with ourselves about um you know setting reasonable expectations and not making commitments or promises that we can't keep i'll, I'll just add to those comments that we did plan the finance committee agendas and i think mm -hmm. here in march we are going to be talking about a revised cost to serve analysis and a revised analysis around the downs and the the benefits of the downs so those are things that are actively in work tomorrow at the SEDCO <laughs> meeting. I think Karen Martin's going to kind of share that a little bit with the SEDCO board as like a first pass review. So these things are happening and and I think we are going to make some significant progress this year on that. And I think Nick, you're very much involved in that as, as well, I think. Yeah, as much as I need to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we uh, move on to the next slide. Thank you for all the commentary. There will be additional opportunities. Uh, I, I value it. As I said, it's not just making it up. These are all good things to take into consideration as we move forward. Um, the um, What I have here is a fairly simple equation, but I, I didn't want to take for granted a uh, percent of change uh, is known by everybody or is understood fully because we will at some point in time once we know the preliminary new values of how properties have increased in assessed value, what percent have they increased or what percent did residential versus commercial? And this is the equation for percent change. Percent change equals the new value minus the original value divided by the original. And then if you multiply it by 100, you get an actual percentage. So if you go to the next slide, um, on the left here first, the little um, call out bigger zoom in that full picture of that slide was from the prior September presentation, which is once again within these PDF agenda materials further down. But that was um, the analysis of the sales ratio, the how our assessed values compared to sales prices of all residential properties in particular um, from 2019 down to the past two years. And then I zoomed in on the past two years for this example. 
if you look at the, the last or the second and third quarters of 2023, which were the last I spoke about in that presentation, you can see it was 58% um, on average for the purposes of the state audit purposes, um, even though they lag a year or two behind. So I wanted to use that as an example to get at the order of magnitude that is possible. So it's you know talked about as early as I can. So it's not a shock at the last minute, the numbers of potential percentage increase. So uh, going back to that uh, little image of the 58% there, the last two uh, bars, um, I, I would hate for someone to be confused uh, and think, oh, the difference between 100% and 58 is that number is 42. That must be what uh, my property would have to increase. Well, that's just the, the delta, the difference. That's not what your property would have to increase by to get to 100%. Uh, and I wanna be clear about that so people aren't misled in any way. Um, for the example I gave under the percent of change on this slide, um, I didn't go to 100%. I chose 95 because as I said in the previous presentation, that's a more reasonable uh, goal to aim for 95% of market value, not 100%, because then some people would be assessed too high above 100%. So if we take the 58% uh, to get it up to 95, that difference is 37. If you divide it by the original of 58, that means the percent increase to get that property, uh, fictitious property here from 58% uh, sales ratio to 95%, would be a 63% increase. And uh, that number shocks or scares me, uh, let alone people that don't see it every day. And I didn't want such numbers to be thrown out in August, God forbid. I, I wanted them to talk, be talked about now as a possibility. I'm not saying everybody's property will go up by 63%, but some people's will. And they can't hear that in August for the first time. And some people's may go up uh, less than that. I would hope not more. Uh, yeah, my work uh, I'm tasked with is to be objective. And as the process is revenue neutral, it's not like we're adding new dollars through that process to ask of people. But I am sensitive that it has a real impact on people. So not only am I stating, I want people to know the potential order of magnitude of the change well in advance, because those numbers can be shocking if you don't even know what that'll mean for your taxes. Um, but I don't want people to, to be confused either. And just to give an example before entertaining uh, questions on this, the example below is a $400,000 home. That number has been thrown out in other communications in past years. I think it used to be 300,000. So that's the assessed value. Well, in this scenario, if we're trying to get it from a 58% assessed value, if it's sold, at, uh, if it sold at 688, that'd be 58%, which is what I'm saying some residential properties are at right now. Uh, so if the, in order to get it up to 95%, you take that 63% increase, it would mean your assessed value of that home would go from 400,000 to 652. That would be the 63% increase, and which would result as is labeled in the bottom a new assessment to sales ratio of 95%. So that in no way means your tax bill will go up by that much or even close to that much. Your tax bill might go up 5%, 10%. It would not go up 63%. But the number, if you just get your new assessed value, this is 63% higher. That's crazy. Well, the, the real estate market over the past years have has been unprecedented. And that's the reason for for that significant change. But I just wanted to be absolutely clear as early as possible that that kind of order of magnitude is possible, but it does not mean your tax bill will go up that much. Mm -hmm. So just your, earlier in the presentation, you had said in your current audit, the A to S ratio is around 64%. Mm -hmm. So is it safe to say for any home that goes to this reval, if their A to S ratio is below that, that those are homes that are likely to pay more taxes as a result of that? Because that a general- that's, that's very close. The only difference I would say is that audit result lags a year. Mm -hmm. So it's already old. 
The 58% hasn't even been audited yet, nor will it for another year. Just, just one quick point I'd like to make. Yeah, let's say uh, property values did go up 63%, and they went up 63% across the board. Yeah. The amount that the taxpayers had to fund of the municipal budget did not change, then a property bill would not change. That's correct. If everybody's property went up by the same exact amount and the budget did not change, your tax bill would not change. Conversely, if everybody's property went up by the same exact amount, but the budget went up 3%, well, then everybody's tax bill would go up 3%. So I think it's a fine, because I think that is one of the common misconceptions is that when property values increase, it increases the amount of revenue that the town takes in, and that is false. Correct. Hey, Nick, um, yeah. we've got about 13 minutes before our regular meeting, so I want to know if you can find us the high point, something that you definitely want to impart to everyone here this evening, and give just a couple of minutes for counselors to maybe fire away some questions. I appreciate that, and please know that if there's times in the future where you'd like me to get to some of the other things, which uh, if you look through the other slides, you'll see we sometimes touched on those things, even though I didn't get to the slide yet, because you ask good questions. Um, I'm happy to come back or entertain other types of communication. So some of the, the takeaways, uh, I would say, I might ask Liam to get to a certain slide number. Uh, can you go to slide 39? It's not so much that that slide has really cool information. It's more so that um, uh, it's important to address some of the frequently asked questions and the recently asked questions. So um, as we've been talking about, some of the questions I have been getting, even though I, I'd welcome more, because I, I do want to know what people want to know. Um, people ask, what are my, what's my new assessment going to be? Uh, these presentations and other materials are my initial attempts to try to get the order of magnitude out there of the possibilities. But like I've tried to allude to, the, the work is not done, nor will it be for two to three months. And as soon as I have that information, I will be completely transparent and um, provide that information. And similarly, what will my estimated taxes be or the impact to my tax bill? The same answer. I, I don't know the exact numbers. And I also, uh, that's a order of two functions, the revaluations effect and the budgets effect. So similarly, that may not be known until May, but as soon as we have more information, even predictive estimates, uh, I'd be happy to help provide those. Um, then the residential versus commercial shift. We did discuss that. Uh, it was perhaps one of the first times where we got into it a little more, but I have uh, heard from uh, people that are invested in this and uh, wondering or informed, they say, this is likely to happen. People need to know. And they're absolutely right. So this was one of the uh, attempts to get that information out there that it is likely, but uh, not to the order of magnitude as we've seen in other towns because commercial properties have appreciated in Scarborough but it is possible they haven't appreciated as much as residential properties. And then some of the common misconceptions, just getting at, you know, whether it's through Facebook posts or um, uh, conversations amongst uh, neighbors or whatnot, um, people really question the motivation at times. And I, I've tried to be clear, we've said we were gonna do this, that's one of the motivations, but more importantly, state law dictates we must. And as of next year, we will be out of compliance with their guidelines for how below market value our assessments are. So we, we must do it uh, to be in compliance with state law and not lose the funding from the state. That is the repercussion for being out of compliance. Um, another thing that's a common misconception is surrounding the budget, particularly how it affects uh, TIFs and credit enhancement agreements, but budget regardless. Uh, we've tried to be clear here about how it's revenue neutral. What that means is doesn't generate any new tax dollars, only the budget does, but it may affect your tax bill. Uh, to the point of how it uh, doesn't have any implications with TIFs and CEAs, except perhaps tangentially, be, uh, I, I can speak to that, that properties within those districts or 
within those agreements are treated the same as every other property in town. They will not be assessed differently. Uh, my process as an assessor is completely objective and based on statistics and industry information. And I do not treat properties with these qualifications of being in a TIF district any differently than properties that are not. So as a whole, they should see similar impacts compared to the rest of town. The only differences would be those uh, parts of town maybe have a slightly different makeup of commercial to residential and they have more new construction than the rest of town generally because they're targeted growth areas. Uh, and we can speak about that in finance committee as well. And then a recently asked question, um, there is a, the unfortunate events of some very serious storm damage in various parts of town. And I've been asked uh, at least once uh, that, but uh, it was recently a good question. Will that be considered? And I, I wanna be clear with, people that I will consider anything brought to my attention. So if you incur damage uh, for from a storm or any other uh, event, or your property has problems, uh, storm related or otherwise, please document them and bring them to my attention. Uh, and it doesn't need to be now. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, as of April 1st is the date I really have to set in stone. So if on April 1st, or when we uh, offer hearings with people in June and July, you have information that proves my property was damaged and I haven't been able to repair it completely yet. If you provide any sorts of information or want me to look at it, I will, and that will be taken into consideration. I just want to build on that point. Uh, we're right in the middle of, I think, seeing links that have been provided to people who suffer, suffer damages, you know, in their, you know, to their homes and properties, you know, in the past week to, to two incidents we had prior to that. Um, so this is like real time, it's just happening now. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, is there a way that you're gonna be piping into this data so that you can be seeing it real time, you know, as people are sending things to the feds to say, this is the damage that I've had, or this is, you know, my new number based on FEMA map, you know, is, do you have you thought through how you're gonna do that? Uh, first and foremost, I will rely on, uh taxpayers to be their own best advocates. And uh, my part of that equation is I'm completely receptive and working with people. So I would say document what you're already documenting for FEMA or your insurance and provide it to me. And I will absolutely take that into consideration. So, and one thing I'd say, people are still in the process of, uh, you know, some pumping their basements and that kind of thing. So trying to fill out a form and send it to, to anybody is probably, you know, gonna be hard to do. So I just hope that we're attuned to that and we'll be, understanding about the practical aspects of that to make sure it can happen mm -hmm. uh, for everyone's benefit. Definitely. We have a few minutes left, so. I have, I have one question. So I know when the last reval happened, it had been, was it 15 years, 14 years? And so a lot of people were shocked and I think people are still <clears throat> dealing with that shock of what they saw. Yeah. So I guess the question I have for you is, um, because we're doing this in five years and because the market's been crazy with everything going up, is it, I'm, I'm trying to have you look into your crystal ball a little bit. Is it less likely that the extent of the shock will be less? Like when I think of Higgins Beach where they went up 19% in terms of their tax bill, is that gonna be a significant outlier this time or is that still possible and likely that there may be some people in Scarborough whose tax bill could go up or their share of the tax bill could go up that much higher? I, I don't know that information at this time. And I, I really wish I did uh, in the sense that uh, I'm committed to providing information to the public as soon as I know it, but I'm not at that point of the process. And as soon as I am, I will go through every avenue possible to even at the rough estimate portion, tell people of that. Um, like I've said, uh, certain properties will uh, experience a tax increase more than others but I don't know the exact numbers yet. Any other questions from the council? Nick, thank you for coming this evening. Um, great presentation and we'll see you soon. I yeah. Mentioned <laughs> yeah. With, uh, further information. And if anyone at home or in the audience has any questions, uh, you can get Nick's information right off the Scarborough website, uh, the town tax assessor. Uh, there should be a link on there for sending him an email or you can call into the office with anything in particular. Okay, thanks. We're going to adjourn. Um, take about a five minute recess before our seven o'clock meeting. Thank you, everyone.
I'm gonna go live here in a minute if you can rejoin us. Welcome to the January 17th, 2024 Town of Scarborough Town Council meeting. You can all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Like what do you mean? 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 Like what do you Councilor Anderson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Chairman McGee? Here. All ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right now we have uh, an opportunity uh, for general public comments. If there's anything that's not on our agenda this evening you'd like to discuss, please approach the podium. You have three minutes and please be respectful and direct all questions to the chair. Thank you. Allison Bristol, 6 Bayview Avenue, which thankfully is pretty much, much left unscathed by last week's storms and unprecedented high tides. Many of my Higgins Beach neighbors were not as fortunate. I often come and talk at public meetings about what's wrong. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about what's right and extend my sincere appreciation to the town, the town administration, the police and fire departments, and the Department of Public Works for their preparedness with road closures and the quick response working with the Rusbera brothers to clear public roadways both on Wednesday and Sunday. The town's presence was felt in advance of, during the height of, and uh, in the aftermath of both sto storms and was much appreciated. I would also like to give a shout out to the Scarborough Santa District for being on top of the championship, uh, Champion Street pumping station mm -hmm. since it failed on Wednesday. We are most grateful. And also most appreciative to Tom Hall and I believe both chiefs for immediately reaching out to the Higgins Beach Association of which I'm on the board to provide information on how homeowners can document storm damage in order for the town to receive federal disaster assistance as well as how homeowners can report uninsured damages. Thank you all again very much. Thank you, Ms. Bristol. Mr. Hayes, welcome. Good evening, Richard Hayes, Martin Avenue. Um, I'd just like to ask you folks to do something about the marijuana issues that still uh, seem to be prevalent in the Pine Point area, especially. I think it's sad that what is happening, I don't know legally what controls, I know it. A recent meeting, uh, council chair said something about meeting with attorneys. I don't know the outcome of that, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> I just think it's a shame that what's happening. Uh, I think we're issuing too many licenses. Uh, I hear that there's a moratorium, but that's only, I guess, for growing operations, but that's about to expire. Uh, I don't know what's in the works to extend a moratorium or, or but I, I just I don't think Scarborough should be um, the center of marijuana growth uh, providing uh, edibles or whatever the uh, best uses of, of marijuana are in these uh, times but I, I just please ask on the, for the benefit of the people in the Pine Point area, especially uh, that you consider doing something to get this long standing problem under better control. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Ms. McKee, welcome. Uh, hello, uh, Nina McKee, 309 Black Point Road. I think. Um, was it 24007 is going to be addressing a moratorium 
Um, so that's, I really want to congratulate you. I think that's wonderful. And I agree with Dick. I think, um, I, I kind of wonder where are these manufacturers getting the marijuana? Are they getting it from cartels? Are they getting it from cartels who are growing illegally? I mean, is that anything that the, the town would be involved with? Or, um, but I do agree that I don't think our town should, should be the pot center of the world. So thank you. And thank you for going through the ordinances. I think it's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGee. Hello, everybody. Paula O'Brien, 20 Pond View Drive. Um, I see that that's on the agenda, so I'll speak to that later. What I, what I wanted to say now, and I'm just going to kind of wing this, um, I'm hearing that there might be different streets accepted for, uh, accepted as public streets for trash collection and or maybe plowing. Um, the neighborhood where my mother lives, there's 20 units, mostly 60 plus residents that live there. Um, they, up until last year, had a private company doing their trash. And I helped my mom with her bills, obviously, so th this came to my attention. But it, when they had a private company collecting their trash, they were paying $1,500 a year. And they were, well, let's see, the second week of September, they were, they were given three weeks to find someone else. They went to Casella. Um, just their trash collection now is $5,300 a year, gone from $1,500 to $5,300. So that's an increase of $200 a year per resident. And they're getting their average um, increase in Social Security is $50 a month minus $10 increase in Part A, $14 increase in Part B, for $26 a month total increase in Social Security income, yet their trash pickup alone has increased by 200. Now that's just trash. And I know Scarborough really prides itself on recycling. And they asked about recycling. To get recycling, and that's just trash, but to get recycling as well, they would be, they were told that they would be paying double. So $5,300 a year for just trash, paying double for recycling on top of it, you know, so you have most everyone down there because a good many of them are in their 80s that are not going to truck it down to Department of Public Works to dump their recycling. Their recycling now is going into their trash. So I think it, it, I, I don't know what can be done down there. And I know there's 20 other neighborhoods that are in the same same boat. But it just seems to me and it's my opinion that to go I don't know what it average costs for 20 houses a year to collect trash, but it just seems like over $5,000 for people that are on fixed incomes is an awful lot. And I, I really would like to see maybe what the town could do to get them. If they had trash receptacles, they wouldn't be putting them out every week because most of them live by themselves and they're 70, 80 years old. They're not going to put up, they'll probably put their trash and recyclables out once every three weeks. So I guess, um, I don't know, they're, they're also looking at, at future increases of the reval, the capital um, projects, and annual tax increases, but, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, just wonder what, what the town might be able to do to help them out, so... Just something to think about because that's quite an increase for their pocketbook. Thanks, Thanks. Mr. O'Brien. Do we have any public comment online this evening? Anyone else in the room? With that, I'm going to close public comment. We'll go to uh, the next item on tonight's agenda is the minutes from January 3rd, 2024. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. A motion, section, discussion. All in favor? Sure, that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next, we have adjustments to the agenda. Just don't have any to offer at this time. 
Uh, treasurer's warrants were signed earlier this evening. And then now we're on to the town manager's report. Um, it should be noted that town manager looks a little different this evening. Um, our thoughts are with Tom as he's attending a, a funeral out of town. Um, and Liam, though, has been briefed and is, is jumping right into the, the fire here. So. Uh, well, if I get this right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll try to do Tom justice here. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, and as already referenced in public comment, um, we're going to start with with the storms that that hit some of our uh, coastal neighborhoods, although not exclusively uh, over the last 10 days or so. Um, people probably forget that we actually had a, a pretty good amount of snowfall uh, prior to some some pretty um, uh, pretty significant rain and, and wind storms. Um, just to give a, an update from staff's perspective, um, we do expect a, a federal disaster declaration to be uh, declared. Um, staff is already well underway uh, evaluating the damage, either internally with their expertise or, or seeking uh, external professionals, licensed professionals, engineers, and, and other uh, professionals of that, that manner to evaluate the damage. Um, just some, some notes, uh, Higgins Beach, um, you know, we, we do have uh, cause for concern around the, the pump station that was uh, identified uh, the, the ramp and some of the beach access, the seawall. Um, down at Co-op and Pine Point, um, evaluating the, the damage to the dunes and, and other beach access points, uh, the commercial pier. Um, again, we, we don't know what this, the level of damage is to this point, but again, that, that evaluation's underway. Um, Black Point Road around Prout's Neck, um, there was some substantial damage to that road uh, from Wednesday's storm, and, and it was accentuated by, by Saturday's event. Um, so we do expect to have Jersey barriers installed to, to keep uh, vehicular traffic away from the edge there mm -hmm. in the in the interim. Um, but we also uh, have some questions and concerns about uh, damages uh, pertaining to the flooding around Eastern Trail, uh, Pain Road Corridor. So um, rest assured that, that that work is underway. Uh, and um, as of today, our emergency management director, who I'll, I'll speak more about in, in a moment, um, did file uh, the appropriate paperwork with FEMA for a preliminary public assistance package. So again, that that uh, which are kind of high level estimates and placeholders um, to get that process starting started. Um, again, as as uh, the resident commented in public comment, I I would like to take this as an opportunity to really express uh, uh, some kudos. I think to our staff, our public safety staff, uh, our public works staff our private partners, um, our emergency medical, our, our emergency management director, who's also our fire chief, really led the way in organizing those efforts. Um, I think Wednesday was sort of a, a dress rehearsal for Saturday's event, and I think we, we performed phenomenally well um, under the circumstances. So um, again, fully appreciate that work. Um, just uh, some other notes, if you didn't see on social media, um, during those events, I think Saturday's event, we had two structure fires. Um, we had a number of other reports of fires that were sending our, our services all, all different ways. Um, we, we pumped, uh, by one estimate, over 600,000 gallons of water out of the Pine Point neighborhood using our pumpers. So um, just a phenomenal effort by, by town staff and, and our private partners to respond to those events. Um, so that's, uh, I expect more information to be coming out on that. Uh, next steps in terms of uh, federal declarations and um, other, other steps along the way. Um, completely unrelated uh, to the events, although um, perhaps there is a, a connection, FEMA flood maps um, were issued, uh, final maps were issued or received notice on December 20th. Um, we are obligated as a municipality to adopt uh, those maps and make amendments to our floodplain management ordinance. Uh, we have six months to do so. Uh, so staff is working on a timeline for those changes and a communications plan with, with communication staff. And we expect this to be uh, the subject of a future council workshop. Um, school building project, I expect there will be some, I know there's an agenda item later on uh, in reference to the new charge and I'll allow the, the, the council to speak to that. Um, just a, a quick update, we, we will be, we do plan to, in partnership with uh, the council and the BOE, to launch a new uh, community survey, a statistically valid one, to both uh, understand kind of the, the rationale or the decision making around the initial uh, ballot measure, as well as uh, what the community might support for a project in the future. Um, so we, we expect to launch that and have some updates uh, before the end of the month. Um, 
and that all this subject uh, around the school building project uh, or a K solution will be also the subject of a counselor corner live event um, on January 25th. Again, I expect the counselors to report out on, on that later on in the program this evening. Um, Eastern Trail, um, there, again, there's, the, there's been a resumption to the biweekly stakeholder meetings. Uh, the last meeting was, was canceled, but the next meeting is scheduled for January 30th. Uh, so that continues uh, to see some attention. Uh, dredge update, I did have an occasion to speak with Darren Granada, who's been the liaison, staff liaison to the project uh, this afternoon. There was really no substantial impact uh, to the project from the, the storms of the last week and a half. Um, they are in the final stage, which is the mooring field to the main channel at this point. Um, again, minimal impact due to the storm, and they expect within the next two to three weeks to be completed with the project. Uh, Revaluation re communication plan, obviously, you, you already heard an hour of that this evening. Um, you know, just uh, to put a finer point on that, uh, I think the, the work that uh, the very capable assessor and assessing staff is doing to make information available to residents, I think, is, is noteworthy. Uh, there's no shortage of information and resources. I know it can be uh, pretty dense and complicated when you get into the weeds, but I think the fundamentals are pretty straightforward, so we'll make sure that those fundamentals are communicated out. Um, no real change to the Avenue 2 update. Uh, the NRPA application for path relocation has been, been filed. Um, traffic calming policy due to the weather, we had to reschedule that meeting. Um, that is scheduled to be a meeting with the Maple Avenue uh, residents on January 24th for the draft policies to be discussed for feedback. Um, and then just a, a few other uh, updates. Q2, uh, so quarter two financial update will be next uh, next week. Those uh, That information is available, but we didn't get it out in time for uh, this evening's meeting, so expect that to be part of the manager's report next week. Um, and then last, uh, just to keep this on everyone's radar, FY25 budget, uh, the manager's uh, plan right now and schedule is to present to council on March 27th. Again, a lot of work to be done between now and then. Um, but I, I just want to call out specifically sidewalks um, during our snow event, uh, which again, it's probably everyone's in everyone's distant memory. Um, sidewalks was certainly an area of concern, our ability to um, maintain them and clear them of snow. Um, just a, a little bit of history, um, you know, sidewalks were previously maintained for many, many years as a, a contracted service that, that ended somewhat abruptly about three years ago. Um, it did require us at the time to procure uh, a secondhand machine initially um, at some level of expense. Um, and really one of the challenges, in addition to, to the geography of Scarborough on our sidewalks and having to move that equipment around, uh, does also come down to staffing. You know, we've been short, uh, you know, four plow truck drivers. Um, I think we're down to three. Uh, that doesn't take into account any illnesses or injuries. Um, and so that just becomes one more piece of equipment that we have to staff. Um, we have been somewhat successful staffing that position on an as needed basis by a, a part-time employee. Um, but you know, to have one machine for town-wide makes it really difficult to get to all the sidewalks in a timely manner. So I expect that to be one of the uh, strategic initiatives that um, requires some investment uh, for the FY25 budget. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Liam, appreciate it. Um, and I think I'll speak uh, a little bit on behalf of the council. We do appreciate the efforts of all of town staff, our emergency services, well done. Um, and of course, our, our, our thoughts and our hearts go out with all of our beach communities. And, and it's not just the beach communities, but anyone that suffered through some, some soggy basements and damaged personal property, it's, it's tough. Um, I think everyone in town gave it their all and trying to help everyone out there. So greatly appreciated. Questions for Liam? Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I just have a quick question. When we had our workshop with the school, when we were talking about doing a survey, I think there's still a question of what was the funding mechanism that was going to be used to fund that survey. So what was the, the final decision there? Has that been resolved? I Someone else could correct me. I, I thought it was uh, possibly looking at, there, were, there was a revenue stream identified on the school side. Uh, the specifics I don't recall, but I I do believe there's some degree of confidence in that. I'm not sure if um yeah it was it was noted the that the school didn't find money for the okay. survey. Thank you, Councilor Hamill. Yeah, one quick one on the survey. I recall uh, the assistant town manager mentioned that uh, we're thinking about doing another one, uh, but that this one would be statistically valid. I thought the last one that we did was also statistically valid. 
It, it was. It was just to make a distinction that this isn't going to be an internally administered survey. There is going to be the same experts brought in to, because I think there's there's uh, value to that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. No other uh, questions for Liam. We'll move on to our uh, first order of business this evening, which is order number 23-140. It's a public hearing and a second reading on the new request for cannabis establishment license from Michael Shannon, DBA Shannon's Best Buds, located at 15 Holly Street, number 205B, for a medical cannabis products manufacturing facility, and Christopher McNeil, DBA Rose Smoke, LLC, located at 3 Commercial Road, for a medical cannabis products manufacturing facility. This was tabled from January 3rd, and just to refresh everyone, um, there was a snafu on the Portland Press Herald side, uh, so that's why it was tabled. They didn't get the the newspaper did not get the notice in in a time. Not uh, not anything to do with the applicant or staff. So here it is again this evening, uh, Liam. Anything to uh, add or discuss on this? Uh, just uh, by way of background, because um, I know that uh, when when these items came up for first reading, um, just some context, if, if the council feels is appropriate, uh, the the license at uh, 15 Holly Street is a proposed acquisition of a currently licensed uh, facility. Again, a, a facility that's already been licensed by the town council um, is seeking to purchase it and, and replace it. And then the the license at Three Commercial Road. Um, that establishment is currently licensed for manufacturing, uh, but by the nature of their manufacturing operation, operation, they require a secondary license to the town. Um, so one component is a lab, one component is a uh, food manufacturer. Thank you. We do have uh, opportunity for public comment. If anyone wanted to speak on these two uh, cannabis license, please come up. Ms. O'Brien, welcome back. Hello, O'Brien, Pondview Drive. As many of you know, I've already sent emails to the town council. Um, years ago when the license or whatever it was was extended to Three Commercial Road, I didn't oppose it. I don't care. I mean, I'll admit what many um, wouldn't admit. You know, I smoked it long before it was legal. I had a medicinal card. You know, I, I don't care. So, you know, but... <laughs> Call me a NIMBY if you want, but when it's located 200 feet from your house and you walk out your door and smell it on and off all week long, this is taken out my bedroom window. You all received a copy of it. There's the building. Here's my yard, 200 feet. There's the building. Here's my garage. It's 200 feet. You know, uh, I didn't know I could complain once we started smelling it. And, you know, last summer we had a combined birthday party for my 88 year old mother, my 99 year old mother-in-law with family out in the yard in a barbecue. It's all you could smell. It's pungent it, as one person described it. There's been a, a sitting school board member and a sitting town councilor who have both smelled it. I invite anyone on the town council to my property to see how close this establishment is. I hate to complain, you know, but it, it, I've been there 38 years. I'm not moving anywhere. I, I couldn't afford it. And, it, you know, um, let's see. The smell is different. It's not someone just lighting a joint up, smoking it and putting it out. It's very heavy. It's pungent. It's there all the time. I can't open my windows in the summertime. There's only 17 houses on that street, so you're not going to see the level of complaints that you do from Pine Point. Um, I don't care what they do in that building. I just don't want to know about it. I don't want to have to live with it every day. I I had um, I went out the door the other day, and and it's like, are you serious? You know, I it's just very. My daughter lived with us for three months last summer with her two and a half year old daughter, my granddaughter sitting out with her in the pool, you know, a little kiddie pool. And that's, it's, it's just very, you know, it's really not fair. I, I pay taxes too, and we, we were there long before anyone else, but I don't know. Um, whatever it is they're supposed to be doing to mitigate the smell, it's not working. And, you know, like I said, I invite any one of you, all of you, to my property to see how close it is. 
I, I don't care what they do in the building. I just don't want to know about it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Any other public comment on these licenses? All right, nothing online. All right, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. I have a motion, is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second, discussion. Yes, Jim Murray. Yeah, um, as has been noted, this is the uh, second reading on these. Um, as chair of ordinance, you will note that we are bringing forward a moratorium, an extension of the moratorium um, for cultivation. These two establishments, if I'm reading it correctly, are manufacturing, which um, doesn't have the odor um, with it. And so I've, I'm, I'm fine with moving these ones forward. So I just wanted to you know, remind people that these are manufacturing, these are not cultivation, so you don't have the odor issues with it. Um, and I will be supporting these licenses. Thank you. So my understanding is that we did have a meeting with, uh, with attorneys and that resulted in a memo Right, and I struggled through it, um, and my impression, and I make this in the form of a question, is that with respect to existing facilities, our options are very limited. Yes, uh, with the exception of enforcement. Yes, and it sounds to me like, uh, given all of the public comment that we have heard on this that we need to step up and get very serious about enforcement because the agreement uh, and the ordinance which was formed basically said you can do this if it doesn't offend your neighbors. And it's pretty clear that it does. So uh, in this case, literally your freedom ends where my nose begins. Right. <laughs> and given that that's our only option, uh, then we need to start thinking seriously about how do we resource uh, and regulate and hold people accountable to what they committed to in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to vote for this. I was misquoted in one of the publications that said somehow I thought this was all a good thing. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I think. Uh, but um, what I do feel like is that we have a commitment to consistency and fairness in our government. These have gone through the process and it is also true that they do not represent any additional licenses and they are manufacturing as opposed to cultivation. So for that reason, I'll be voting for it as well. But I wanna underscore that I think we really need to step up uh, and have some serious discussion about how we enforce the ordinances that we have in place. Thank you. And I'll just I'll just throw into um, yeah I do want the public to know that we are hearing and we are listening and we were actually we are taking action. Um, we are going through the process. It has to go through the proper process, just like anything else here. Um, and again, I, just because these are the last ones in front of us, um, I'm not going to hold them accountable for all the sins of their predecessors. Uh, and it. You know, as far as um, where I think we're pointed, and I don't want to jump the gun or put words in people's mouths, but as you can see, there's a moratorium uh, on our agenda. We have a memo discussing um, if we wanted to eliminate um, cultivation in town, how we could get there. Um, that memo, I believe, is on in the packet um, and on the website, right? So uh, for anyone at home that wanted to see what the attorney is advising us, uh, it is accessible. Um, so with that, if there's no further comments, I'll take a vote on this. Okay. All in favor. Oh, yeah, I did have Sorry. one comment. Yes. Number one, uh, it is not proven that, uh, manufacturing, uh, does not produce an order. Number one. And number two, uh, I raised these concerns and objections last time. And I hear that, you know, we're made all kinds of assurances. We're going to do better next time, but I, I disagree with the bundling of these and <clears throat> trying to put them through. And uh, I, I think we're spending more time on worrying about amortizing losses of operators than paying attention to our residents and not allowing expansion. And I applaud the efforts that 
uh, Jean Marie as chair of the ordinance committee in April have uh, put forward in terms of uh, extending the moratorium, but I, you know, I, I'm not voting for this again this time. Any other comments? Sure. All in favor? Opposed? Show 6-1. Thank you. Next order of business tonight is order number 24002. It's public hearing and second reading on the proposed okay. amendments to chapter 1002, the town of Scarborough shellfish ordinance. Who do we have kicking this one off? Don? Uh, I would say last time we had... Uh, we had experts here. This time you got an amateur. So uh, not much has changed since the first reading. So you're going to have to rely on the expert testimony that was given last time. But this was followed a very thorough process. We had um, uh, Noah Nigren, um, who was the chair of the Shellfish Committee, uh, representing the efforts of that group. And I participated in most of it. So this is uh, just asking the council for their good judgment to uh, approve this uh, the second reading unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone here to public comment on this? Please approach the podium. All set online. All right. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Discussion. Seeing none, I'll close discussion. Call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Show that as unanimous. Thank you very much. We're on to order number 24-003. It's a public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 311, the town of Scarborough scheduling of fees relating to non-resident day passes. Again, uh, Don, I'll, I'll spare you on this one. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, part two uh, of what we had for a presentation the other evening. It's fees cleanup. Uh, if there's anyone here that wants to uh, speak publicly on this, please approach the podium. All right. Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. And do we have a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and second discussion. Seeing that, I'll call it. All in favor? Opposed? Show sure that is unanimous. Thank you very much. On to new business, order number 24-005, first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance, section 19.D, regional business district, regional business district B-2 and D, special exemptions in section nine performance standards. Ms. Spear, welcome. Thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, so this item has been kicked around for quite some time. It was actually in front of the ordinance committee last March. And so uh, put together a PowerPoint just to give you sort of the background, just to remind everyone what this is really about. It's a housing conversion um, ordinance that came from the Housing Alliance is an idea to increase affordable housing options to convert uh, existing hotels and motels into affordable housing options. And so that's where the idea uh, was generated in August of 2022. So the Housing Alliance had originally looked at all of the different units of the motels and hotels that we have in town and identified the zoning districts that those all fell under when staff met with them um, in November 2022, we further redefined the target. So you can go to the, the next slide. Um, we really focused on the B2 zoned property and the map is in your packet. Those are the five uh, hotels and motels that really made the most sense to try this out, if you will. The B3 um, zone is just two different hotels and lodging establishments on Route 1. And then the other TVC districts actually could already do this conversion. Multifamily is allowed. So the next slide, please. The um, This is just a recap of where those five um, unit, the hotels could actually be converted. So these are the only five hotels and motels that we're talking about at this point. And so the Housing Alliance also had some recommendations on the next slide uh, that they wanted to make sure that were carried into any ordinance. And it had to do with how much of the units were affordable, how much could be workforce. And I know it's a, so they wanted to have at least 50% affordable and workforce and at least 10% of that to be truly affordable housing units. Um, they also wanted to make sure that the units were distributed proportionately. You didn't have one end of the hotel, so to speak, is the, the lower, um, cheaper units that didn't have the same amenities. They wanted it to be fair across the board. Uh, building codes apply. They have to be self-contained units. 
And then one stipulation was the rate of growth ordinance would not apply as long as they did not exceed the number of current hotel or motel rooms. So and that's how the ordinance is written. So the next slide, the proposed language, and this is adding a use to the B2 zoning under the special exception process. The special exception is an approval process that's given to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's a 30 to 45 day process typically. Um, so any applicant would go before them and ask for this use to be allowed. A special exception process has a substantial number of basic requirements that any type of special exception request has to meet, but then there are also additional requirements that this particular use has as well. So the next slide, I won't go through all these, but all of those give you an idea of what the basic requirements are. And so it's really about making sure there's no noise, um, no harm to your neighbors. It's in the right location. So they have quite a bit of things to analyze these requests against. So the proposed performance standards on the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, are the, there's eight of them total uh, on this slide and the next slide, but these are all the requirements that are put in for specifically just for this use. So it has to do with all of those things that the Housing Alliance had wanted in their original proposal. And then there was one addition through the process to add um, that they had to have uh, 12 month lease agreements. Mm -hmm. So this was discussed during the ordinance committee, trying to figure out how to make sure that we didn't have um, very transient uh, rental units. And so all of this is in the proposal. Nothing has been changed since that March uh, 23 proposal and the ordinance is attached. Um, if you go to the next slide, it just shows you if this were to get approved, so it would affect the B2 zoning and it would affect the five uh, establishments that are already in place. And those, any applicant would have to go through our office and then submit for a special exception to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And if they were granted that, then they would go through our office and follow the site plan process. So it'd be quite a lengthy process, but we would be able to work through that with, from staff level. Um, next steps after this, this is the first reading, the planning board public hearing, and then town council public hearing and second reading. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. So I think I read that this recommendation was based on the idea, and maybe Marie, that hotels are not being used. And so I think my question was, are there currently hotels coming into Scarborough right now that are looking to locate here? How many? Yes, we actually have had um, two hotel requests since I've been here, uh, which is about a year and a half now. So this was prior to that, I think, yeah. originally. I can address that. Sure. This is Jean Marie's bill. <laughs> um, I can see it. <laughs> um, this came out of COVID, to be honest with you. Um, there was a, a request by a developer to develop, um, now I can't think of the name of the hotel. It was down yeah. by, yeah. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. I can never think of the name of that yeah. for whatever reason, to make Candlewood into apartments, so to speak, workforce for workforce housing. <laughs> and for the general public, there's a difference between affordable housing and workforce housing. It has to do with income. And basically workforce housing, if I remember the numbers correctly, is for people or families, individuals, families making between 60 to 120 percent of the HUD salary, whatever the number is now. And it's pretty high, actually, for this area. Um, and I jumped right on it because I know from my work, both with the Chamber of Commerce as the former liaison to the chamber, and then my ongoing work work with Maine Municipal, that there is an extreme shortage of housing for people who work, you know, who do the jobs, who work in our banks, who work in the insurance companies, you know, the, the entry level positions and the waiters and the waitresses and, and, and people who work at the stores. Um, so I thought it was a brilliant idea, um, but we weren't able to do it because we didn't have any ordinances that would let us do it. So this came out of that. I would like to see us adopt it as a town. Maybe we don't have hotels right now wanting to convert, 
but I do know that it is something that is occurring in other areas of the country because like Maine, uh, the whole United States right now has a severe housing shortage. It's just the name of the game. And you heard about it with the assessor and, and whatever. So I just see this as a way to have at least something available if the opportunity presents itself so that we can provide workforce housing to folks. That's that's where I came from. And then I put it out through um, the Affordable Housing Alliance, which I'm the liaison also. And it's been a process and we had to put it aside because of other things. But I, I wanna thank uh, Autumn for all of her work and the work of planning on this. So I'm hopeful that you will support at least moving it forward to the planning sure. board. And I did have another question. Yep. And I don't know if you can answer it because the chief is here from the fire department. I was curious if with the cost to serve, because I know we're evaluating it right now, is the cost to serve a hotel is higher than a like a apartment unit complex, apartment mm. complex? Because in my mind, I guess suddenly you have an, a building filled with kitchens. I, I have concerns that the cost to serve would be substantially higher. And I think that's just a consideration that's going into my mind with that conversion. And I'll comment on the GMO stuff when we have council comments. I, yeah. I'd like to build on that if I may, that point. Sure. About cost. Let's just, well, I don't know if I can oh, get, I, 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 wanted, say, I wanted to make it a question. Right. And I, I'm so putting it out that there. That sounds too. like good counselor discussion. I'm sorry, I know. You moved it yet. Yeah. So I would, I would say that if we have Autumn just on standby, I'd like to turn this over to public comment, but there's a lot of good questions. And Autumn, I do think that we're going to have to have you back up there during counselor discussion of this. Is that fair? Sounds right. good. So I'm going to open this up to uh, the public for comment. Well, again, Allison Bristol, Six Bayview Avenue. When I saw this on the agenda and read the attachments, I said to myself, are they kidding? Are they kidding? Did they not listen to the statistically valid survey that was just completed that said that 77% of the respondents were very concerned about growth in Scarborough? This does not this does not come out of area one, area two, area three growth permits. So it's a whole nother pool on top of the affordable housing and the workforce housing pool. So is the next step that this turns into a TIF district? And then there's a CEA to help the developers turn this into affordable or workforce housing and only 50% of it is affordable or workforce housing, where does it stop? You know, there are taxpayers here uh, that are also concerned about affordable housing, but they're concerned that they're not gonna be able to afford to live here anymore because of the tax increases and that we seem to be subsidizing. And it's not to say that affordable housing or workforce housing isn't valuable and important. I, and I would also say that what was brought forward in this memo was under the previous growth management ordinance. Now we have a new one. And I, and I haven't studied it. I haven't gone back and looked at the history that much, but I believe I'm correct in saying before the current rate of growth ordinance, there was affordable housing. There had to be 10% of what was built was affordable housing, period. I think we need to go back to that model. And I think that under the current rate of growth ordinance, I wanna say, is there 685 uh, growth permits over a three year period? 10% of that could be affordable or workforce housing. You're killing the rest of us by opening up every opportunity to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bristol. Any other public comment? We have one online. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman McGee and members of the Scarborough Town Council. Eamon Dundon here, um, Director of Advocacy at the Portland Regional Chamber. I just wanted to speak briefly um, to ask you to 
uh, vote to send this to the planning board this evening. Um, we've been involved in this issue for a number of years, um, back to when the owner of uh, the Candlewood Suites and the potential buyer approached us um, about potentially um, some workarounds to, to move forward a project that would turn um, uh, a more extended stay type hotel um, with a very transient population uh, instead into a property that would provide um, affordable housing uh, for individuals who live and work in our communities. Um, and so, you know, housing has been a, a number one goal of the chamber for reasons that um, Councillor Katarina described. Um, and we saw this as a perfect opportunity to take existing property um, uh, where there wouldn't be any additional traffic impacts, things like that, and turn it into um, housing for people that live and work in our communities. Um, and I, I just want to remind the council that these types of properties, the units that they're building are very small. So, so first of all, in the cost to serve front, very unlikely to have impacts on the schools. I think that's something you can take an additional look at. But these are going to be efficiency units, studios, one bedrooms at most. Um, these are targeted, as, as Councillor Katarina said, to entry level workers um, and, and they're existing already. So there's very limited impact to the built environment. Um, and, and they're also naturally affording, uh, 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 naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, you know, these aren't affordable housing projects that are going to require a large amount of subsidy because, A, the cost is a lot lower to do these conversions than to build new housing. And, B, again, these are very small units. So they're going to be naturally at a much lower price point, and there won't need to be subsidy from state taxpayer, local taxpayer, federal taxpayers, et cetera. Um, so I think there's more of a conversation to be had in the cost to serve and, and perhaps some more numbers to be put there to support um, some of the assertions I've made. Um, but I'd ask that you continue this conversation by sending it to the planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get your name one more time? Eamon Dundon. Yeah, Eamon Dundon. E-A-M. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? All right. Seeing then I'll close public comment, turn it over to the council. Uh, is there a motion? So happy to move this forward. Is there a second? <laughs> second. A motion is second. Discussion. <clears throat> All right. Karen, you got some more questions? Oh, um, <laughs> Well, I mean, my question was if someone can clarify to me what it, if it's more, if it costs more for a town to serve a hotel or an apartment complex um, was one of the thoughts that I had. And since we're having a counselor discussion now, I will say that I will support this going to planning, but I do not support it being exempt from the GML. I'm with you, Karen. I think that it, more consideration <laughs> and more understanding makes sense. But I do not like the idea of uh, exempting it, uh, making it a separate category in the GMO. I, I think that affordable housing is something we all support, but I don't know why we have a growth ordinance if we you know, are going to keep creating new categories for it. So thank you. Councilor Hamill. Yeah, you know, I, you know. Uh, I've seen this movie before, you know, it comes down the chute um, and here's the recommendation. It's hard to argue with it. I, you know, I work with Jean Marie on this sub objective for us this year, uh, affordable housing, workforce housing, uh, conceptually and from a principal standpoint, you know, it's something that's important that, that we've supported. Uh, however, we're at a point, a uh, critical point where, uh, you know, we're being asked to move this forward to planning. What often happens is we we do that, and then all of these questions that come up about costs to serve, and you know, suggestion that it'll have a zero impact on cost to serve, zero impact on, you know, anyone in schools. I just don't think this is proven. And I I read through all of the material, and as I said before, I I support this conceptually, but when it comes down to actually approving it and knowing that it could be ten percent of all of our units altogether. Um, without really working through, I hadn't seen a single number on here in terms of any costs that would, would flow to the town. And we still haven't updated our own cost to serve and other measures like that. We still haven't counted all of the units that are in the queue that have already been approved. So I, in view of that, I, I think this is a premature for us to even go forward to the planning boards. I just, I, I uh, I've seen this before. We, we and, and then we'll never get to the, uh, you know, the point of saying, uh, where, where do all these costs come from? Um, so I, I understand this is a category of housing and a category of, you know, where the hotels are really struggling and, and it's a creative idea. So I support all of those things, but not, a, not if we're going to be bearing the costs all along or uh, without any help from, you know, uh, 
federal, state, or regional uh, groups. Uh, I think that's a lot to ask of us. And I don't think we can, this is, would end up being a, an uncapped liability potentially. So I can't, I can't support this now, um, even though I support it conceptually. Thank you, Councilor Hamill. Councilor Katarina. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for all of your input. I mean, everyone has the right to their opinion and that's why we're, we're here. Um, I, I don't, I don't think one way or the other about impact on GMO. That's fine. If we want to make it subject to GMO, I don't have a problem with that. What my concern is, is that we need to be creative with uh, housing for folks who are, you know, just in the very beginnings of their, of their work. Um, it's, we have hard enough time recruiting teachers. I mean, starting pay for teachers in Maine is $35,000 a year. I mean, give me a break. Um, we've got fire police personnel, you know, starting pay for those. It's good pay. It's good pay compared to a lot of jobs. But when you look at what the cost of the market cost of apartments right now are, it's, it's insane. My concern is, you know, people say, well, you know, we can't afford this anymore. My question is, who do you think is going to work? Who do you think is going to be serving you in restaurants and cooking meals for you and uh, being working with you in the banks? Um, you know, when you walk in, yeah, you can do a lot of banking online, but every so often you have to go in and meet with someone to open an account or whatever um, for all of those types of jobs. In my business, I frequently see young people who would love to come back to Maine and can't afford to. My daughter pays $1,300 a month for a heated apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, a big city. She couldn't get an apartment in Portland, Maine for that. So this is why I at least want us to look at it, have it examined thoroughly. This is why we have first readings, so that we can get numbers, so we can get the feedback from SEDCO, so we can look at cost to serve. Eamon had some great um, points, and I'm glad he made them uh, regarding, you know, it's not like we're tearing out the floors of the apart of the hotels and making big apartments. It would be just converting those rooms, because they do have the bathroom and the room, and, you know, maybe there'd be a kitchen. I mean, that's what we'd have to be creative with or look at. But um, I'm just asking that we move it forward for further uh, examination, because it's, it's a huge issue in this area. Um, and I've done my own little informal survey when I go to the bank or I go to the grocery store or whatever. I ask people, where do you live? They're living an hour, an hour and a half from here. And think how much their transportation costs are. We don't have public transportation in Maine. It's not like in Chicago where my daughter doesn't have to have a car because she can just get on the metro or whatever. So anyway, that's my... Okay. Council Anderson, <laughs> I, I do have a couple questions. I don't know if Autumn can go back. I mean, we, we've talked about what to serve and and I actually disagree a little bit with Jean Marie. I would say for this to come to us, that should have been already vetted. And in the packet, it says no impact or NA, which I think at least some of us up here feel like, no, there's got to be some impact. And I don't know if it's better or worse. So have has that been discussed? No, it like, has not been discussed. I'd be happy to to discuss that with um, Nick and, and Karen. But no, that hasn't been part of this discussion. Okay. Do you know how many of the the complexes that we're considering, how many one, two, three bedrooms that could potentially be converted? I just know the total per um, each hotel, motel. So there's about uh, one, two, three, 450 total units now. Is it unlikely that there's any three bedroom? Like, I don't know if these establishments oh, yeah. would have. It's, it, I would say it was unlikely. I, I would say most of them are probably just uh, at the most, they might have suites that are joined that they can turn into a larger unit, but that's probably two units now. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and this is just more of a question that I don't fully understand when I re read the ordinance. So I get that we're, we're going to qualify the conversion to meet the criteria, but part of my concern is the hotel converts and then after 12 months, they jack up their rents and now they no longer are qualifying as affordable or workforce. So there is no mechanism in the ordinance today, or is there that kind of prevents them from having significant increases in their rent? They would have to be deed restricted. So it's number five. Uh, that's for the, and number four. So was it fifty percent needed to be deed restricted, or all of it? Fifty percent needs to be deed restricted, affordable, or uh, workforce, and then ten percent of that. So you could have forty affordable and ten percent, or uh, excuse me, forty workforce and ten percent affordable. And those were minimums. Those were minimums, right? So that's so this could certainly be yeah. changed. Well, I was trying to read in our ordinance definition <laughs> for, like, I, I understand if it's deed restricted affordable housing, but the way the ordinance reads, it's rent. Like there's a different definition. So it mm -hmm. didn't jump out to me in our ordinance that if this happens, those units will be restricted in the rental increase. So is that the case in, in these, that the rental increases would be restricted? Yes. Okay. It, it was the conversation that was brought up. Like how would we be able to manage that um, and who would provide that oversight? Okay. So that's definitely something to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, okay. they would be restricted on how much they could go up. If if we didn't move this forward and one of these um, hotel providers wanted to convert, I'm trying to remember with Candlewoods, was it a contract zone amendment? Yeah. So so even if this doesn't go forward through a zoning change, any, any hotel could essentially come forward with a contract zone amendment in the future and offer that as a means to convert to affordable. Correct. Okay. So with that, I personally would be more comfortable rather than making a zoning change that we are clear to, to hotels that if you want to convert, do a contract zone amendment, because I think that's a better approach. It gives us a little bit more um, visibility. And since it sounds like there aren't any uh, hotels right now that are actively seeking to do this, I feel like we don't need to do this right now. And I also think, again, just the timing is poor based on what some of the um, public commenters said about the growth ordinance, we haven't had a chance to really talk about, or sorry, the survey. I don't think we as a body has have had an opportunity to talk about growth. And here we are creating a new mechanism that facilitates more growth. And I just feel like timing is not good for this right now. So I would rather this not move forward. I would rather us continue to think about contract zone amendments if we wanna allow this to happen. And, and if any hotel out there wants to do that, Submit an application and we'll review it. Mr. Chair, thank you. Can I answer? Yes, go ahead. It wasn't the hotel owners. The hotel owners wanted to sell to. And when you go through the contract zoning, um, there were a lot of hoops to we were just trying to make it potentially easier uh, for this to happen if it came up to happen, because in some ways time is of the essence and making sure there's uh, housing for uh, work for the workforce in town and just looking to be creative. And I'm not saying it doesn't have to be governed by the GMO, just saying. <laughs> April, you look like you're ready to tap that microphone button. <laughs> Whenever we're ready, I'll go for it. So I think that this is, you guys, you know, I process things as you're talking and um, I like to really think about my comments before I say anything. Um, John shifted me a little bit. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm really, well, you want me to go next? No, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ramble, but I'm ready. Um, I think that this is really important work to do. And there are a lot of components of this that make me uncomfortable at the council level that I trust will be worked through at the planning board level. And so there is part of me that feels like to have this sit at the council level and for us to decide this, this isn't work that we want to take on right now. I don't feel like it is work that I need to take on right now. I feel like maybe this is work that we need to put to our staff and to the, the planning board because they are more familiar with the impacts and the things that that I'm just not familiar with. I was, I actually really don't like the contract zone approach um, just in general. 
because I think it is so subjective. It has that public benefit component to it that makes us all like really squirmy when we're up here. Um, and so I would like to see a process that is more clearly defined and levels the playing field for any kind of requests that come through. The flip side of that same coin is I think some of these motel hotel um, that I suspect would probably be good candidates for this are not in locations that I think personally that I would necessarily support that type of conversion. And so I really keep kind of going back and forth on, I think that this is important work and I do think we should explore it. I think it doesn't take much for us to look at how we can incorporate this into the rate of growth ordinance. That's our job. Um, and so I don't want to shut down the mechanism completely just because we you know, have some issues that we would like to see addressed. And so I'm going to vote to put this forward tonight with the understanding that um, I think that there's a lot of work left to do, um, but I, I, everybody's making some really great points. Thank you. Councilor Hamm. One question. Have we estimated the number of units that this would bring forward to us? Do we have that number in here? The maximum number of units, and that's if they used every existing hotel uh, unit that they have right now, would be like around 450. That's, for, that's if for all rooms five. converted to one bedroom right, units. Right, so that's, right. So that's 460. That's a one to one. 450 is about the number. Well, I just say I, I stand corrected. I said there was no number in there. There is a number. That's a big number. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't quantified the number of of permits that are already approved and haven't you know been pulled yet okay we haven't done I have that I, I have that that's available on our website uh, I mean as a body okay. we haven't discussed that I I know you're always like a step just, ahead. just so you know it's available um so I, I what's the rush here okay I know that people want to do it the need is clear but the, you know um I just think that we need to know more and I I think we're at a point where we need to just say Stop for a moment. I would forget saying stop, pause. Let's just pause for a moment and take a deep breath and try to understand a couple of things. You know, revisit what we're being told in recent surveys, quantify what's happened in the past week in terms of destruction um, to our town. Take a, another look at, and I know a bunch of counselors are working on this as well, our sustainability and environmental initiatives. And then, then maybe we kind of take a step forward on, you know, how many more units we're gonna we're gonna approve. And I I, I agree completely with the points that Jean Marie has made that of the need for workforce housing, the need for affordable housing. There's no question, but but it's a but it is a question about how much we're gonna ask the public to pick up the tab for this. And and we need to really socialize that and make sure we're comfortable with it, and we're not bearing that burden entirely on our own. And um, Anyway. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take a stab at this, if you don't mind. Um, so a couple of things, and, and great. I, this is good discussion, and it's the first that anyone's hearing about it since, you know, 2002, you know, and 22. <laughs> it's, so I don't think anything's being rushed, in all due consideration, Councilor Hamill, this has been lingering out there. Is it is it picking up... Um, some momentum in the sense of we're being asked to dust it off and look at it again. Um, and my thoughts are, you know, it's gone through Housing Alliance, it's been through ordinance, it came from conservation, right? Or is that not conservation? Um, uh, no, straight from Housing Alliance. Okay, came straight from Housing. I thought it had another stop in somewhere, but now we're asking to send it to Planning Board. And it sounds to me like we're giving all of our town committees, you know, a, a decent crack at it. Even if it came back to us, I would expect full on workshops, right. financial modeling. Right. I mean, this is far from like, you know, we're at second read and it's time to, to raise your hands, guys. So um, just a couple just generic thoughts on something like this. You ever ride down Biddeford and Saco 10, <laughs> 15 years ago and look at those big pepperel buildings and be like, man, why doesn't anyone do anything with those? You know, talking about repurposing existing uses. Um, so this has that opportunity. The other thing that popped in my head is there's nothing stopping any one of these motels or hotels to sell tomorrow to a new developer, demo a building. They ask us for a CEA and they put in a, you know, more affordable housing units. We might end up in the same boat, except for now are we funding it with a CEA model um, and we're at the same spot. So for what it's worth, I, 
I'm I'm a, I'm willing to see this go through the process a little further with with definitely a, a commitment that this is not going to be rushed through at any stage. Right. I also would not support anything unless this um, this does qualify for GMO permits. I I don't like end arounds on what we've done. We put a new system in place July first, and the last thing I want to do is find a way for it to be exempted from it right out of the gate. Um, Councilor Anderson, with all due respect, the, the contract zone, like April had mentioned, makes me a little squirmy. Mm. It's basically a request to do something that you're not supposed to be doing in that spot. Right. So I, and it, and it does come with its own set of seven separate hurdles and whether or not that's fair to those business owners as well. Uh, you know, I, I question whether or not we should be creating those pockets of, you know, you, you're allowed to come this path instead. So I would I would prefer if we're going to allow any type of conversions or uh, or reuses of buildings in the community that we try to be standardized with it. Yeah. So um, those are just where my head is at. I have no problem personally sending this to the planning board for having them maybe identify some other areas that might be weak in this that we're not picking them on the spot on. So, mm -hmm. Council Anderson. Yeah, I would just I would just respond to that that with with all due respect that these areas weren't zoned for this type of unit. A purpose at some point and now rather than going through the contract zone process when we're doing a deviation from the zoning we're just changing the zoning so i see it as we're kind of making a blanket change without fully understanding the impact and i would also like make my my perspective clear that when things come to council at first read my expectation is it has gone through significant work like we shouldn't be here today asking the question about cost to serve and not understanding that. So I, again, I still feel like there's more work to be done that this was premature to get to us. Mm -hmm. I don't think the process we have next should be doing more work. I think that should have come to us with those, those things answered. So that's just my perspective that, you know, mm -hmm. seeing an NA for financial impact when we know there's a financial impact to me is, mm -hmm. is not accurate. And I, I would like town staff, to work to bring us a full package when we're doing a first read so that we can really make an informed decision if this is ready to move through the process. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, I don't feel like that's happened. Sure. Liam? Just a note, I, I, just the with regard to the cost to serve, I, that is obviously a subject that's, that's come up and, and is really gaining some steam and traction. Um, but I think it is it's still a relatively new concept to look at through that lens. And, and as we've talked about, it is a it is a complicated it can be a very complicated equation and measurement worthy of discussion. So um, just just a footnote about um, I think it probably followed an appropriate process, but I think the the importance of that conversation has really elevated over the last period of time. Council Hamill. Yeah, one one comment. And we'll in one fell swoop here, we're just basically moving something ahead that's over 450 units. Okay. That's more than what uh you know is in you know would be uh it's it's a comparable number to what would be allowed under the GMO. So there we go. It's another year's worth of units right there. Bang. Okay. And it doesn't count what's already been approved. It's in the queue. So I get the whole, you know, zoning versus uh you know, versus contract zone process argument. I get all of that, but we're just not listening. We're not listening. People have told us to slow down growth uh, and look at spending. And well, thanks a lot, but here we go again. Second, you know, second meeting of the year and we got this thing in front of us. I, I think we're- Nobody's making... issuing permits here, Don. <laughs> Councilor Katarina. How did it make it? How did it make it on the agenda? That's my question. How? How was this sitting in queue and it's the next one it's to go? Sitting in queue for a number of years. Well, okay, oh, yeah. so we have aging process now that we're we using. Council Hamill, Council Katarina, let's go. Council Katarina. Uh, uh, first of all, 450 units are not going to come on all in one fell swoop. I mean, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Secondly, contract zoning is kind of a weaselly way around zoning. Um, not to be pejorative sounding about it, but. And our GMO. Yeah, and the GMO. Um, so this is why I really feel very strongly that, you know, if we're going to do this, it does need, it's an, all it is, it's an addition to what's allowed in a zone, period. But I don't disagree. Let's look at GMO. Let's look cost to serve. We did talk about a lot of that. And it was so long ago that I can't remember. Um, but anyway, so I would appreciate the support to at least move this forward for more work. If it's not satisfactory, you just say no in the second reading. That's all. I would I would just say that 
you know, maybe the first reading portion of this is kind of a mistake. It really should have just been a request for this council to refer to planning board. Um, and that's really where this probably should have been at because that's that's where it needs to get vetted further. I mean, clearly it needs to get vetted further. So, um, you know, I guess that's that's on uh, your chairman to make sure that it doesn't say first read next time around. Um, but I, I think what I'm asking this council to do is conceptually, can you get behind an idea like this conceptually, not necessarily implementing exactly what you're reading tonight, but in concept, would a conversion work in Scarborough? Because if that's an end goal, if that's something that we should be pursuing conceptually, then we should be putting it through further paces. And then, I mean, nothing's getting approved this evening. It needs to be workshopped and we need more information on the financial side. We need more information on the zoning side. So, Councilor Cushing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think we do need a lot more information. I think personally, the notion that because we are proposing and discussing these things now suggests that we're not listening to town people uh, is faulty. I think that we need to put all the options on the table and we need to thoughtfully go through those options. <clears throat> and so if the past work of this council has been, uh, as Councilor Hamill suggested, this train, once it gets by first reading, has left the station, it strikes me that that would have to change, that this is, in my textbook, a deliberative body, and we need to deliberate. And so I'll vote with many reservations to move this thing forward because I want more information, and I think the questions are legitimate. You know, do you want, what is the cost to serve? You know, when, when somebody says the financial impact on the town, personally, I don't completely understand that. I'm assuming that because it's affordable housing that maybe that reduces taxes or something. But my suggestion to the folks who are putting these things out here is that these proposals need to get a little bit more baked. And it shouldn't be really difficult to anticipate the kinds of questions and objections that this council is going to have. So I'll vote to move it forward. Um, because I really would like to listen. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Cushing. Any other comments on this? Councilor Anderson. So, so if this does move forward, I just, I just want to make sure from a process perspective that it doesn't go from first read planning board, public hearing and second read. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to extend the time between first read and second read probably longer than we have on anything, because I, again, I go back to, we as a body haven't really taken time to digest the results. I think conceptually, this is a good idea and it makes sense. And I know a lot of communities are doing it, but what's our affordable housing strategy? What does good look like for us? What are we targeting in terms of number of units we wanna see in the next 10 years? Is this the best strategy to get there or are there other things that we wanna do? I feel like moving this too quickly is, you know, pushing out tactics without thinking strategically about what we want to do here. And I feel like I just want to make sure that there's a long time frame between first and second reading if this moves forward. I can't see this happening quickly at all. <laughs> if that, you know, if that gives you any reassurances. And again, this first was reviewed and proposed by Housing Alliance in November of 2022. I mean, we are, I mean, it has been a while and, but clearly based on our conversations, even here tonight, it's still got a long ways to go. Um, you know, is it worth sending the planning board for their review? Is it is it worth workshopping a, yeah. a few times? Is it worth getting in maybe even in front of finance if we need to get in the cost of service stuff? Okay. And Councilor Anderson, to your point about whether or not, you know, we should have had a, a goal setting meeting before even discussing a topic like this. Maybe. Um, I mean, we still have uh, affordable housing goals from 2023 that we're we're currently working towards. Um, I suspect we'll probably just see an extension or, um, you know, kind of a reaffirmation of, you know, a trying to achieve those goals in our next setting. But again, we meet in you know, almost you know, a little less than two weeks on that. Um, conceptually, I, I guess I don't have a problem thinking this one through and putting it through the paces. Whether, I mean, if I was asked to vote on this tonight, just straight up whether or not this was going to pass or not, my answer was a hard no. I, there was plenty in here I don't like, but it hasn't been worked through. And that's part of this process, so. 
with that said, I'm, I'll am i call a vote um, and see, if, and this is to send it to planning board. It's uh, nothing's passing this evening. So um, all in favor of sending this uh, to the planning board. Opposed, show 5-2, thank you. Uh, next item tonight is order number 24-006, first reading in the schedule of public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment, chapter 311, town of Scarborough schedule mm -hmm. fees relating to lift assist. Chief Kindlin. Would you like me to do a brief segue? Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, just as a, a, some background on this item, this was uh, an item that was originally proposed and, and discussed at finance committee back in October of 23. Um, and it's really an, uh, an opportunity, I think, to uh, generate some revenue from a, a service that we we fairly regularly provide um, to some of our skilled nursing facilities and, and other, um, I'd call them professional operations or commercial operations. Um, so that's the, kind of the background to it. Um, I'm, I think that the chiefs are here to answer any specific questions um, that you may have. So I don't know, chiefs, if you want to come up and provide a more expansive overview. Thank you. Would you like additional information on it? Or right, do you have right. any questions? Okay, perfect. Um, so this is a fee that we've requested to add to our uh, schedule of fees, and uh, it's strictly for lift, assist lift assistance or moving of patients for um, uh, license and staff facilities. So that's the important part is that these facilities, it's not a uh, to an individual home or a independent living facility. It is for uh, licensed facilities that are staffed with people. And um, the request for service is typically for us to come and either just lift or simply move a person. And um, that, that's all that's warranted for that. Um, from the chief's background information on the, um, on the agenda packet is um, really not only these types of calls uh, pressing for our service and our providers, um, but they're really calls that we can't be reimbursed for currently. So uh, that $300 per call is uh, really on the lower level of what other agencies in the state are, are doing and billing for. Uh, some of the larger services north of us are uh, billing at a higher amount. Um, so um, really the budget impact isn't gonna be large for the revenue stream of things. We're looking at about 75, 100 to about $10,000 per year. Um, that gives us roughly 26 to 40 ish lift assists that are billable. Uh, there are often times that we go for lift assists that uh, we do do an assessment. We find that maybe in injuries uh, that they either may be signed off and not transported to the hospital, but uh, some of those also end up as a transport to a hospital. Um, I think another thing that's really important to add is that uh, we have met with three of the larger facilities in town, and uh, we've had some really good positive interaction, positive conversations with them. And um, I think we all came out with a mutual agreement on or, or a mutual um, understanding as to both of our services that we provide to the people that they're taking care of and that we're summoned to take care of. Um, but uh, really, those those conversations um, overall supportive of of what our request would be yeah, i just add you know the reality is that um these are facilities that again have professional staff but for one reason or another have chosen to rely on uh, our emergency medical services to either perform assessments or uh, literally do the, the heavy lifting and and there uh, are certainly it takes a unit and you have heard and will continue to hear uh how the demand for our emergency services have, has only increased um, this is certainly one of those reasons, but while they're performing what is otherwise a fairly routine service, uh, it keeps them out of service. It makes us more reliant on mutual aid, um, and it, it incurs a liability to the agency that we don't feel we should have to take on without any some, any additional cost or consideration. So it's a it's a level of um, uh, I think you know I think there's a component here that we're increasingly uncomfortable with, and there's an opportunity here to hopefully not only recoup some some revenue, but also uh, act as a deterrent uh, and, and encourage them to, to handle that in-house. If I can add, we did reach out to every agency that this would affect. Uh, only a few did uh, did reply to Kevin and uh, we did meet with them directly. Um, Piper Shores, the Enclave, um, Pine Point Manor, mm -hmm. I think was another one. 
Um, and none of them really were concerned about what we were asking for. And really, to, to Liam's point, uh, we are starting to tread down a pathway of non-emergency work. And that's not what Scarborough Rescue was ever designed to be. We are not, uh, and these facilities are being compensated to take care of those people, but pawning that responsibility off on us. And uh, at any rescue service in the state, the only way they're able to get reimbursed is in a transport capacity. We don't transport somebody. Uh, we can bill a very small amount, um, but it's it's will certainly not cover the cost of our cost of service, things like that. So I was on finance committee when you guys came before us last, and I, I felt like I was getting the impression that, I mean, these facility employees were specifically being told not to pick people up. And there was some of an avoidance of employees getting hurt and they're simply fielding out, like you said, these simple tasks to have you come in. And then the town is now putting our staff in a position where they might get hurt because of these situations. So I support this. And also I just wanted to comment on the fact that when they did come to finance, we did discuss the cost. I was like, oh, 300 seems high. And then you know we had a con conversation around what other towns are charging and this seemed very reasonable. Thank you. All right. We have opportunity for public comment on this topic. If there's anyone here who'd like to speak, please approach the podium. Nothing online. All right, I'm going to close public comment. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a motion and a second? Uh, discussion. Yes, Councilor Hamill. Uh, number one, thanks for the great work you guys have done the past and a half or two or whatever. You know, great job. We had a lot of people complimenting you on the extra efforts you had to go through in my neighborhood and throughout town. So thank you very much for that. And I, you know, was with Karen and John Clushy when we saw you at the Finance Committee. I think you guys did a great job at that time laid in the laying the foundation for this. So I support it entirely and uh, appreciate you coming back. Thank you for that, Councilor. Thank you. So I got a question. Oh, Just, sure. Yeah. Liability-wise, um, are we putting ourselves in a position, I mean, when we go and provide these services, I'm, I guess I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come to terms with why, if you have a fully staffed healthcare facility, that they're not engaging in these activities. And is it a transfer of liability over to the town if something happens on transport? I mean, we are covered anyways because that's what you do. I mean, how does that all in our work, like work to get on transport? I, I don't think we're uh, we're exposed any more than we normally were. We have very strict protocols mm -hmm. through the state of Maine and through the medical director's practice board. So we had no, whenever we transport, we're good. What where our exposure comes is that uh, workers' comp exposure. Mm -hmm. Where you know lifting lifting and trips and falls are the two biggest injuries that fire department and EMS really face on a regular basis. And um, to, to the uh, um, counselor's point, counselor Shoup's point, there are facilities that have strict policies that say, we do not lift patients. Your staff do not. But the other pieces, I, I, this has just been a trend that's kind of come, uh, been happening over the last five years. Just like us, they're facing staffing shortages. They're having a hard time getting qualified people that, you know, having RNs that can be there 24 hours a day. All those things are just kind of gotten to a point where they had to get creative with trying to figure out how to take care of their people. And they, it was very easy. 911 comes every time you call. It doesn't matter what time of day or night we come. And it just became very easy for that. And I think this is just saying that we need to, we need to be recognized that we need some compensation for that. It's two paramedics. It's an ambulance. It's a half an hour at the minimum for any of these calls. Um, there is a cost for that. Just one more point of clarification. Um, and I think it was clear on the materials, but this is this is just a fee that's billable to these professional facilities. It's mm -hmm. not billable to our private residents who fall out of bed in the middle of the night yeah. and need help getting up and need an assessment that's still provided at, at no charge. Can I just correct that? Pardon me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. There's no, this fee is not There's associated. A very with... nominal fee. Um, however, uh, in our policy, we have a lot of leeway to write off certain charges for, for residents that pay taxes. It was built by my predecessor long ago. So important clarification. This fee is not. <laughs> right. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. much. With that, um, I will call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Actually, sure that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Chief. Next item on tonight's uh, agenda is order number 24-007, first reading and schedule the second reading to repeal and replace the ordinance establishing a moratorium on adult use mar cultiva marijuana cultivation facilities and medical marijuana cultivation facilities in the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District. The town council approved on August 16th, 2023, and enact a new ordinance 
establishing a moratorium on adult use cannabis cultivation facilities and medical cannabis cultivation facilities that would apply townwide. Liam. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess where I'd like to, to start here is the, the, the actual action in front of council this evening is uh, a proposed repeal and replace of what will be a, a effectively our fourth moratorium uh, pertaining to the cannabis uh, industry in town. Um, again, I think in the, the supporting documents and even in the moratorium itself, it, it does give that history. Originally, the first moratorium was townwide, all cannabis, at that time called marijuana, all marijuana establishment licenses. Uh, the second iteration was limited to the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District, all cannabis licensing. Uh, the third iteration, which is currently in place, uh, is uh, unique to just cultivation in the Pine Point Overlay. Uh, and um, that action was taken in conjunction with some changes to the licensing ordinance to include two main components. One was an increase in the odor mitigation standards and record keeping, and, and there's some other smaller pieces to it, but that's sort of broadly what it was, uh, as well as the incorporation of, an, of a much more robust progressive enforcement process. Um, the, I think the, the belief at the time, or at least the recommendation and rationale from staff to the council was that um, to, to continue to, to have a hard freeze on any changes to uh, cultivation operations in Pine Point in order to give a period of time to, to see whether those standards would improve uh, the odor complaints or concerns, um, as well as give a, I think, a much more defensible uh, enforcement process to see how that would play out um, and give a six month period for that to play out and see. Well, here we are five months in. Um, I think uh, a few things have, a few observations from my vantage point. Uh, one, the, the odor complaints have not uh, gone away completely. I think there's been some anecdotal testimony and, and comment from uh, residents abutting the Pine Point Overlay District that things have improved, although they certainly have not improved to a level that they're uh, completely happy with or, or find satisfactory. Uh, I think another, measure, another point I would make is that the odor complaints, again, as evidenced by uh, some public comment this evening, are not limited to the Pine Point Overlay any longer. Um, they do uh, move into another part of town. Um, and so five months in with the ordinance change, uh, what I can say is complaints have not gone away. Um, and uh, the enforcement process, which again, I, I think you probably are all familiar now with the rationale uh, of the enforcement protocols. It was again intended to be reflective of some pervasiveness of the odor. Um, that's why it was not simply um, odor complaint and follow up or enforcement. There was intended to be some measure of that. Um, Perhaps I, I think the suggestion now would be that that enforcement provision is perhaps too rigorous or complicated and, and is worthy of reconsideration by the council. Um, so the action before you, and, and again, I have some other information I'll, I'll go through, but the, the action before you this evening is proposing to repeal and replace the existing moratorium uh, to institute a moratorium on all cultiv cultivation operations across the town, not limited to Pine Point. Um, and uh, through June 30th of uh, 2024 was the recommendation of the ordinance committee. Um, the belief would be that during that period of time, um, uh, revisions, further revisions to the licensing ordinance around enforcement, perhaps looking at something that's far more straightforward and less complex, uh, looking at the enforcement authority are two thoughts that were discussed during ordinance. Um, and then also have the, the council would have the ability to look at non-conforming uses and zoning changes with regard to cannabis operations. And that is the, the context of the memorandum in your packet from legal counsel. Um, so uh, before I, I turn it over, I guess I do also want to, uh, there's been a number of questions about um, what we have for licensing operations to so just have a, a bigger picture um, for where these are in town. Um, so I, I will make one footnote out of the gate that we actually do have one manufacturing, it's a beverage manufacturer um, in Innovation Way, which is in the Downs. Um, that is a permitted use. Uh, they have been relicensed. Uh, my understanding is that they they were not confident that their operation was going to continue, so they're not referenced on this map, uh, but there would be one other dot in the, in the Innovation District. Um, 
But what we've done is we've broken out uh, by zone um, where the facilities are and what we have for licenses. And again, we've tried to flag both currently licensed as well as uh, licenses that are somewhere in process. So this is the snow canning road, uh, or this is the Pine Point Industrial Overlay District. So the industrial zone is actually the purple that's highlighted here. So you'll see it goes across uh, Pine Point Road and then covers the Holly Street property. Um, 15 Holly Street has two manufacturing operations. The one pending, again, is a replacement. So even with the action this evening, it's still two manufacturing licenses. Uh, 10 Snow Canning Road has 11 cultivation licenses, 10 of which are medical, uh, one of which is adult use. And then 20 Snow Canning Road, which is a separate building uh, along, uh, is this building here. Um, so it's along the, the railroad tracks, has three cultivation licenses, two of which are medical and one of which is adult use. Um, so that's sort of the snapshot of the Pine Point Overlay District. Um, by my count, that's uh, 14, 16 licenses. Um, again, for some context here, um, there's, and I commented on this in ordinance committee, um, I would make the same comment again this evening. Um, in terms of uh, council agenda fatigue, um, following the process that the council has largely uh, followed over the years of a two reading and public hearing process, for 16 licenses, that would have been 32 separate actions of council, not including any food handlers licenses, of which there's probably a handful in there. So um, just as an idea of how, how this industry populates agendas, that's, that's one of the reasons. Moving on to um, Pleasant Hill Road. Um, so again, there are six buildings, uh, six facilities that have licenses. Um, in this building here, there's two manufacturing uh, licenses. Again, this was one that up until about six weeks ago actually had two different, uh, two different uh, businesses with four total licenses, but again, one has um, shut down their operation. Uh, three Commercial Road uh, has three cultivation, including two that are pending, and, and these, they are, their applications have been submitted but not yet come to council, so that's why we're defining that pending. Uh, and four manufacturing. Um, with two medical and two adult, including the action that took. So one, one that's an example of one business that has five separate licenses through council, potentially as many as seven. Uh, so for one building, that'd be 14 separate actions of council, uh, including food handlers licenses. Uh, for commercial road is one cultivation license, it's adult use, um, again, Early on, this was a, an operation that, and, and just again, for some more background and context, some of these uh, operations, especially, uh, especially in Snow Canning Road, came forward with requests for both adult use and medical licenses, and then chose not to make the change to adult use. So they just didn't renew their adult use license. Uh, for Commercial Road was one of the ones where at one point they had two licenses through council for cultivation. Uh, they never moved forward with their, with their, or they dropped their medical. So they're just adult use now. 137 Pleasant Hill Road uh, has four manufacturing licenses. Again, it's two separate businesses, two in the, two in the medical realm, two in the adult realm. 18 Mayetta Way has three cultivation licenses, two adult, or I'm sorry, two medical and one adult use. And then 148 Pleasant Hill Road, which is one that's in process. Um, that's gonna be requesting a manufacturing license. Uh, and it's essentially, it's a packaging operation. It, they don't manufacture anything. Um, they just simply take their product and put it in baggies and then put a label on it. Um, but they would require a license through council to do that. So in, in this corridor, um, I, I, again, I, I, you have uh, five, nine, um, just counting on the fly, 10, 14, 17, 18 licenses. Um, so, or 18, 18 uh, separate operations. And then lastly, this is the one uh, probably area of least concern. Um, not surprisingly, you, you, you will not see any residential neighborhoods around here. Um, uh, and again, we have a manufacturing license at 4 Washington, a manufacturing license at 11 Washington, a cultivation license, and a manufacturing license at, at 31 Washington, and two manufacturing adult and medical at 23 Washington. Um, so that's a high level overview snapshot of, of where our current licensing and cannabis operations exist. I think that's my introductory comments. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I was trying to tally all those numbers. Um, all right. So we have opportunity for uh, public comment on this item. If anyone wants to speak, please approach the podium.
Nina McKee, 309 Black Point Road. You know what? This is out of control. I, I mean, that's a lot. And, you know, I, I'm really concerned. And I think what's happened is there hasn't been a strong grip on the whole thing to begin with, and people are just going crazy. So I'm really appealing to you. I hope that this new ordinance maybe can say no. Can you say no? I don't know if legally you can do that, but good heavens, we don't need all this marijuana in our community. And where does it go? And who who puts it in there? You know, where is it coming from? I mean, are we supporting the cartels? I mean, I imagine the manufacturing has to get it from somewhere. So I just appeal to you, please, we don't need this in our community. Just say no, that's a lot of licenses. So have fun. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McKee. Ms. Bristol. She's a tough act to follow, I'm just gonna let you know. <laughs> <laughs> a tough act to follow. Um, okay, so I've been following this, as Councilor Katarina will know, showed up to the very first, even before I got to ordinance meeting, I think in, I think we'd had like five meetings before it even went to ordinance to, to explore the well, whole, lots and well. lots of meetings, okay. So there's also um, resident comment fatigue, right, on this subject. But um, I guess why I wanted to speak up the, and I also sat on the um, uh, marijuana working group to try to figure out what we were gonna do because I've become so familiar with the topic. So even though the Pine Point Overlay District really isn't my battle to fight. I can certainly relate and appreciate what the residents of Bickford and Holly Street have to live with, which doesn't seem right. So I was, um, and I appreciate that the council is trying to do something about it. Um, but in reading attorney Saucier's memo and to see what the answer might be is an amortization over five years when the marijuana ordinance was put into was adopted in 2020 so that's nine years that residents have to live with this i mean we talked in there was one comment in the working group that stuck with me was a what and and miss o'brien said the same thing tonight there was one of the residents that had a birthday party for a toddler in her backyard and all the parents show up with other toddlers and they have to have the party with the smell of marijuana. So, you know, and again, it's, this is not being judgmental about anybody and it certainly isn't to criticize, you know, the efforts that have been made with the snow canning road property and um, the licensees to try to rectify the situation, but I think it's just untenable so a couple of points that I wanted to, to share, um, and again, looking at, at attorney Saucier's memo, and I didn't haven't studied it that hard, but it says, you know, so if cultivation was no longer allowed, I think it says continuation of nonconformance, any lawful use of buildings existing at the time of adoption or amendment of ordinance uh, and may nonconforming may continue. Well, if you look at the Pine Point Overlay District Ordinance and you look at the purpose and applicability, and I understand there's grandfathering for, you know, uh, caregivers and medical marijuana before it was made legal in, in um, whenever it was made legal in the state. The purpose and applicability in, uh, in that ordinance is to allow existing buildings to continue to, to be used for manufacturing, processing, treatment, research, warehousing, storage and distribution, and any other compatible uses until such time property is redeveloped. So if there was cultivation, and that, that ordinance was adopted in 2012. So if there was marijuana cultivation, agriculture in there before 2012, if I'm reading it correct, correctly, it was there unlawfully unless 
zoning didn't apply, okay? Then um, the marijuana cultivation, manufacturing, and testing was tagged on as a permitted use in 2020, but again, the purpose and applicability did not include cultivation or, or agriculture. So I would hope that there would be something there to work with and to try to remedy the situation. And the other uh, thing I'll throw out there is looking at the state statutes, Title 17, Chapter 91, Statute 2802, Miscellaneous uh, Nuisances, I think address the property rights of people and, you know, to, that, that are injurious to the comfort and happiness of individuals and the public and injurious to property rights are public nuisances. So, you know, again, I know that everything has been, you know, everyone has tried very hard to make it work, but I agree with Councillor Hamill. What about the residents? What about the values of their properties and their happiness and their rights to enjoy their home? And do they have to wait another five years to have it made right? So I hope you'll all consider that as you're working through this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bristol. Any other public comment this evening? Anything online? Okay, I'm gonna close public comment. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second discussion. Yes. I'll just, um, I could just start off real quick. I, I want to just say that uh, for those that haven't had the chance to check out the memo, I think um, we have some good advice from council in there. Um, I know one of the comments was the five-year point, and I think what's probably, and I, I don't want to speak like I'm an attorney, I think what's what needs to be, we need to be aware of is, is any actions we take outside of what the state Supreme Court has ruled on, which was mm. during the billboard case, which was a five year off ramp was deemed a reasonable amount of time. It doesn't tie us to taking action and limiting it to five years from now. We could always say, you know what, two years is enough time. What I think this council needs to consider in making that judgment though is, is that gonna get challenged legally? And do we end up in, in a court fight? What we do know is the standard set forth by the state of Maine Supreme Court was five years was an acceptable amount of time. Nobody's tested it at three years. Nobody's tested it at two years. You know, so, um, you know, we might be dipping our toe into something if we wanted to be more aggressive than what the attorneys recommended. We just have that at the front of your minds as we discuss this and what we want to do. But uh, Councilor Katarina. Yeah, I just wanted to speak as the uh, chair of ordinance. Um, we definitely, as ordinance committee, know that this needs to be readdressed. And we guess this was going to come back five years ago, six years ago, however long it's been. Uh, but now we have some uh, experience under our belts with what's going on. So what we're voting on tonight would be to institute this moratorium, which is allowed by law, is as long as you are working on some solution or, or you've got some goal in mind. We can't just put a moratorium and say, too bad, so sad. That's not how the law works. So what we plan to do as ordinance is to look at our various options. And I know speaking for myself, the questions I asked the attorney when we met with the attorney, when Nick and I met the attorney with the attorney was, can we stop licensing altogether? Can we put a cap on licensing? Um, you know, what, what can we do as a community? Uh, and that was why Phil sent the memo that he sent which is in a lot of it's in lawyer speak <laughs> where they say, well, you know, maybe and this and that and the other thing. Um, but please know that I'm as tired as you are of every time I go over to Pondview Drive or drive down Pleasant Hill Road, who do I call Liam? Um, and mm -hmm. lately it's been really bad. So it's not just Pine Point. So please rest assured that we are, you know, I'm going to continue to work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I just, I hope by the time this next moratorium is up, we're not putting another moratorium in, that we have some conclusive decision as a body. I will say my perspective for the Ordinance Committee to consider is 
I'm fine with making all marijuana uses in the Pine Point overlay as non-conforming uses. And I'm fine going down the amortization path if it takes five years. It is unfortunate that it takes time, but in my mind, nine years is better than having it there for 60 years. And so if that's what it takes to kind of go through the process and do it right, I'm supportive of, especially in the Pine Point overlay, definitely making cultivation a non-conforming use. Uh, manufacturing, I feel like I go back and forth, but I feel like in that particular neighborhood, it just doesn't feel like um, that overlay is really a good location for this type of, of facility. And so I'm, I would be fine if we as a body made all non-conforming uses in the, the Pine Point overlay and then eventually do the amortization. I'm not as worried about some of the other districts, especially the industrial park. Like that just doesn't seem, like that seems like a good place for cultivation, for manufacturing. Um, I feel like the challenge we have is more where we put these facilities. I don't know if we're ever gonna solve the odor issue. I think mm -hmm. marijuana and odor go hand in hand. You know, as much as the technology will evolve to make it better, I think it will always be there. So for residents who live nearby, they will likely always smell. So either we're going to have to come to terms where if we have it in places where it's close to residents, that that is a choice that we're making to say there is going to be a smell and you're just going to have to get used to it if that's what we want to do. Um, but but for me, the priority is the Pine Point overlay, make that non-conforming use and do the amortization um, and figure out how we get it out of there in perpetuity. Thank you, Council Anderson. Council Pushing. So we do have an ordinance that says that the odor needs to stay inside. It, so it shouldn't be something that people have to live with. And when I've asked questions about the enforcement of that, it, you know, it, it's been a resource issue, the wind blowing, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and I'm not discounting that. I mean, those are real issues. But it is clear that whatever we're doing about enforcement now is not really responding to the needs of the neighborhood. So uh, I'm with Councillor Anderson that I'm not sure that we want to be Scarborough in the Supreme Court over this thing. And that if, in fact, we think that there is a legal way to sort of end this thing once and for all, and it takes five years, well, then, then we should do that. But if I'm sitting down there at the birthday party trying to explain to my uh, relatives and neighbors, you know, why it smells like Spicoli just arrived here, uh, <laughs> I'm not, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't cut it. So I would ask um, Liam that perhaps you guys go back and to come back here and explain to us what a detailed plan for enforcing the ordinances that are on the books right away. Um, and I guess the second thing I would say is that if I lived in that neighborhood and I had a neighbor that was intransigent in terms of doing things that were imposing upon my rights, I might pick up the phone and call a lawyer and see if I could take civil action against that entity all on my own. So I think the town can do what we can do, but I don't think the town is the neighborhood's only option. And uh, I understand, you know, people don't have the resources to do that, but I just, maybe they don't, but I just want to point out that those resources are available. So without belaboring the point, let's, do some law and order in the meantime, get a long-term solution. Thank you. Councilor Seiler. Uh, Jean Marie did a great job summarizing what we talked about at ordinance. Um, I think that this approach at this point, we can all acknowledge needs to be twofold and it speaks to both ends of the dais here. So we need to have an enforcement protocol that we can, that is funded potentially um, with more resources than are available to us now, or we need to have a discussion about where alternate resources could come from um, to enforce the policy that we do have in place. We can talk about changes to the policy we have in place in terms of making it um, maybe not such a long process that we discussed as the cannabis working group. But then, you know, to 
to Councillor Anderson's point, like I'm okay with a with ex, with accepting that this is going to be a long process of phasing this out in certain places in town. And I think the ordinance committee is committed to having those conversations. And so council input at, you know, at tonight's meeting is really important in terms of guiding our work so that we come back to you with something that represents the way you feel about this. Um, and it's, it, the, the, the third kind of tier to this story is I, and I think it needs to be said probably repeatedly is this is not for a lack of, of effort mm -hmm. on anybody's part. And I am really grateful and appreciative of all of the people who did commit their time to the cannabis working group, who come to meetings, who make public comment, who have gone through every single step that we have asked them to do to mitigate this problem. And, you know, I think it's just time that we look each other in the eye and say the mitigation is not working. Thank you, Councillor Sather. I'll just, I'll throw this out there as an idea for us. Um, I agree, yeah. ordinance needs clear direction from this council, what our intent is going to be. And I think the memo did outline some options. I mean, there's, you can fully opt out of it. You know, you can fully opt out as a community if we needed to. We can, we could deal with the zoning. We could, um, you know, we could restrict it to, you know, just manufacturing only, which, in theory, doesn't have the smell behind it. So there's options. And I think, I think Councilor Anderson, you said it best. I don't want to do this in June again. I don't want another extension. I want a solution. I think the community wants a solution. So here's what I'll, I'll throw out there. And you tell me if this is a terrible idea or not. I will, I'm writing surveys these days, left and right. I will send out a questionnaire to each of you before our workshop school and just get your sense of where you are with all of the options listed. Like I could go for a full out removal and opt out. I could go for limiting zoning. I could go for, just to get some compiled data on where we are on the million different ways this could turn. You know, our, a question like, are you willing to go to court over this? You know, is it, is a three year off ramp? Is it a five year? You know, I have no problem putting this together if you're agreeable to it. And then I think we, we should dedicate a little of our workshop time really getting on the same page about the direction we need to send ordinance and how we're going to craft it and what we're going to do. Is that reasonable? Yep. Yeah, head's nodding. I love it. Okay. Um, other comments on this, uh, on the moratorium action itself this evening? Anyone? No? Okay. With that, I'll, I'll call the vote. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Show that as unanimous. Thank you very much. Our next item uh, this evening is uh, order number 24-008, the act on the request from the police chief to accept a $1,500 donation from Stacy Wood uh, White, does anybody know that one? White, if I said it wrong, I'm really sorry, Mr. White, uh, to be used for basic necessities for individuals or families in need. And I'm, I'm happy to speak to this. Um, uh, so the the bit of background here is that uh, this is a this is a neighborhood fundraiser, and every year this uh, group of I think there's actually multiple neighborhoods now um, have sort of this uh, neighborhood fundraiser, and they select a worthy recipient for their donations. and And this year, this group selected uh, the Scarborough Social Services Program. So um, under the guidance and supervision of uh, Lauren Dumsky Martin, she's uh, uh, committed to donating these funds to worthy recipients in our community um, under the guise of their mission. Right. Opportunity to comment from the public is available. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. I have a motion. So moved. Second. Motion, second. Uh, discussion. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, Ms. Voigt um, for, for this donation. Um, and if there were other neighbors in the neighborhood involved, I just think it's fabulous. Anything we can do to help uh, individuals in town, I'm all for it. Yes, I think that captured it well. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all in favor? Opposed? So that is unanimous. Thank you very much. And we got order number 24-009, act on the request pursuant to Title 23 MRSA substatute 30, I'm sorry, subsection 3025 and the requirements of section four, the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance to approve the acceptance of public infrastructure as noted 
and recommended by the town engineer. Angela, thank you for waiting so patiently for this portion of the, the agenda. Um, Angela Blantat, town engineer. I'm here tonight with um, the request for street acceptance that's being made by one of our developers in town. Um, the two streets in front of you this evening are within the downs. It is uh, Pacer Way and a portion of Hackamore Avenue. Um, uh, and as we go through with all of our street acceptance, um, it begins with the planning board. They go through the subdivision process um, and design. Um, during construction, we have oversight, not only with town staff, as well as a third party consultant um, that goes out and we collect testing and inspections throughout the whole process. Um, at the end of this, we have gone through and um, confirmed that all of the necessary infrastructure that is outlined in our ordinance is completed and um, acceptable for those standards. Um, we have the documentation to legally transfer that to the public sector. So um, that's what you have in front of you this evening. Um, there is a map, because I know it gets a little confusing um, with new streets and where they're located. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have this evening. Thank you, Angela. We have opportunity for public comment on this item. Ms. McKee, welcome. Me again, Nina McKee, um, 309 Black Point Road. Um, my question is, have the, have the abutters around these roads been consulted? I think the town can do whatever they want, but but it seems to me that um, it, it's kind of it's kind of mean to take the land around the town. I'm it's the map. It looked like it was all in in the um, residential area. So I'm wondering if residents have been uh, um, have approved of this and whether it matters whether they like it or not. Just my concern. Because at the school situation, oh, that was pretty sad with the street. Thanks. So Nina, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna help here a little bit. So what happens is when the developer goes and puts in new housing, um, if they if they design the streets to a certain width and a certain standard, they can offer it up for the town to take them over. So if the town says no, the developer would end up private plow service, private trash service. What this is is they've built the roads to our standards and now they're asking if the town will take them and then we'll plow them and we'll pick up their trash for them. Um, so it's not, we're not taking land from anyone. It's just, uh, it's a kind of a formality of us saying you've built this the right way. We can offer public services on it. Well, thank you for that. Um, so does that mean that we are also paying for snow plowing and doing the whole thing? We would, we would on the publicly accepted roads, correct. And, and why, I mean, was this an agreement beforehand when, or how did this happen? Or can any developer say, well, I'm gonna turn it over to you? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so any developer can, as long as they build it to town standards and offer it up and we agree to accept them, that's how you get public roads. Yeah, and that really does put strain on the, on the maintenance department. But anyway, it thank can. you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you for that. Just add to there is a public process during the planning board portion of it. So um, the developers go through um, a very rigorous uh, process, not only with the planning board, but also public comment um, on what they're doing. So that's that's usually when that piece happens. So I just want to throw that out there too, that there this isn't happening kind of under the radar. <laughs> it's just is it from beginning to end? Seems like a long time. Sure. <laughs> um, any other public comment? All right, I'll close public comment, turn it over to the council. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Right, motion, second, discussion. Council Anderson. I, I just more have a question, um, Angela, and it's not necessarily related to the item, but to the public commenters who spoke earlier about like how the town makes distinctions between when we offer public services and when we don't. So I don't know. And that specific example that was shared earlier, I think you were here. Like, why, why, why is the town not providing services there? Is it because we haven't worked with that landowner to say, "Hey, we can take it if you follow our standards"? Or like, what, what, what makes that distinction? 
Well, I will say, um, again, it, it's really vetted through the planning board process. So all of these are considered um, with future public streets or it's a private street, right? So with a private street, we're not plowing or picking up trash um, necessarily. But so how that happens is during that process, because a lot can kind of come out. There's a um, they take into consideration comments from public works and from engineering and, and all of the above. Um, so that's all part of a very public process. Um, and I know a lot of times that is a back and forth to say, is this gonna be private or public? Mm -hmm. And it is weighed against, do we have the resources say, and to add more to our plow routes, things like that are all considered at the time the developer first comes in to propose it. Um, and that's why you'll see also in my memo um, from past council, councils going through and saying, well, what are we doing for a burden, say, to our public works plow routes? And that's why you'll see with each street acceptance, I add, here's how many lane miles we have. Here's what we're adding to. Um, I think you will find in these dense areas, they keep getting a smaller, you know, mm -hmm. addition. But in dense areas, it also is a little more time consuming. So there's some consideration with that. But again, that is um, something that kind of has gone back and forth when we have staff comments. I think you'll see that. So, so it sounds like there's a vetting process that happened. And so for that property that was mentioned earlier, it likely went through the vetting process, was decided to be private. If, if, a, if the landowner wanted to appeal to kind of say, well, maybe we want to be public now, is that an option that they can go through with the town to kind of say, we changed our mind or so we'd like to reopen of, that conversation. So if you're going back to that's site plan, so it's it's kind of a different animal than what is in front right. of the council tonight. But I will say there are a lot of um so we we pulled out a lot of the site plans for some of these condos that we're hearing. It was um again kind of discussed during that process with the planning board and there are notes and stipulations on those plans that is recorded saying um, say trash pickup is will be by the developer. So to your point on how that works for, I would think it would have to go back to the planning okay. board for that discussion because you're going kind of against that planning board approval. Um, but that's an engineer talking, not the planner. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're asking me. you the questions. I was just curious. I always yeah. like, oh, maybe you need to go back to planning board. I don't know. That's my most thing, but <laughs> I can I can offer too just some insight from my professional life where I we manage yeah. condominium associations and a lot of the times the developers in order to build to a street standard they may have to include sidewalks granite curbing certain lane widths and what happens is at some point that developer makes a conscientious choice as to whether you know uh no sidewalks and narrow streets saves me a ton of money on my asphalt laying it also gives me you know i might have space restrictions and if i do it to public with i might lose the ability to put a unit on it or right. they have all sorts of different considerations so when they're not and and having this conversation with a lot of condo owners and the condo boards that we manage <laughs> they're they're full taxpayers and why don't i get my trash picked up why don't they pick up you know why don't they plow my lanes um they're all fair questions but at the same time it really stems back to the beginning of the process yeah. when that developer made a conscientious decision not to build a road right. to spec or uh, didn't had you know had made it known that we're never going to be this will always be a public way this will never be a public you know yeah. that's the trade off and I mean that's kind of yeah. one of those things when you move into those associations mm -hmm. you have to go in with your eyes yeah. wide open yeah. well that's just and really interesting because when we think of like the survey and the sidewalk question about people mm -hmm. saying that they wanted better sidewalks like part of me wonders. How much of that is within our control versus if it's in places where the developer made choices that essentially prohibited that from happening, then there's only so much the town could do. So thank you for educating me a little bit on this. Yeah, I will say that, yeah, going back to those, because we do get a request sometimes just asking to become a public street, like to your point on these very dense like condo developments and to your point, it was laid out in a way that really doesn't allow us to be, to be able to get some of those kind of uh, vehicles in there. And in the trade-off was that developer were able to put additional units in at the time. So that's where that comes from. And I have experience with an association in Portland that actually wanted to go back and say, we, we want this, the city to accept this and the cost projections on redoing their roadways to the proper widths and adding all the curbing and everything. 
just they were like, now nah, we'll just keep the public trash pick up. <laughs> you know, it, it's expensive. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Or not to mention setbacks. And that, setbacks that are, and all. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's even if you had the space, right? Um, anyways, uh, any other discussion on this? I believe I motioned and seconded. Yeah. That's excellent news. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? i show that as unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item on uh, the agenda is order number 24-010, act on the request from the Shellfish Conservation Commissions to approve the shellfish allocations for the 2024 season. Liam or Tody, look at that. Um, yeah, this, at the December 12th uh, meeting of the Shellfish Conserva Conservation Commission, they, um, the only thing they changed, the allocations are the same except for the day non-resident they added to 10 per day, and they increased the fee to $20, which I believe they just approved. Uh, the reason that we had to add 10 non-resident recreational licenses was um, DMR. We were not in compliance with DMR. Oh. So it's actually 10% of every 10 license <laughs> you have. And the, of course, that would only mean one. So the uh, committee decided to just do another 10 for the non-resident day licenses. So everything else stayed the same. All the other allocations stayed the same. Thank you. We do have opportunity for public comment on this item. Seeing none, I'll move it to the council. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, I'll call a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Show that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item is order number 24-011, act on the request to approve the names of the Ad Hoc Open Space Committee. Councilor Shoup. So as you know, one of our goals in 2023 was the 30 by 30. And what came out of that was Councilor Katarina's suggestion to create an Ad Hoc Open Space Committee. And what our reason, what we're thinking was now that we have the town working, uh, they're in the process, I believe, of hiring a consultant to do the open space plan. So this committee is going to work coincide with that consultant and work to create the open space plan. And that's what we're gonna be beginning in spring. So what we have tonight is the nominees from the, from the different committees that we identified that we felt would be good to be work together. So I will read in the nominees that we have tonight. So we have the Conservation Commission, which will be Maggie Vishnu. We have Parks and Conservation Land Board, which will be Doug Williams. The Community Services Advisory Committee will be Patricia Brigham. The Long Range Planning Committee will be Robin Sanders. Shellfish Committee is Darren Granada. Coastal Waters and Harbor Advisory Committee is Liam Erickson. Scarborough Land Trust is Andrew Mackey. Friends of Scarborough Marsh is Crescentia Maurer. And Scarborough Fish and Game Association is Mike Kane. And I'll note they put alternates, but we didn't ask for them, so I didn't. <laughs> there they are. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we do have opportunity for public comment on this item. Ms. McKee. Nina McKee, 309 Black Point Road. I'm sorry to be so vocal, but, <laughs> you know, I'm concerned about the ad hoc committee because the real need is schools, 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 schools. And if the public gets a sense, there's this, this um, group that's getting together about the community center. I think the whole emphasis has got to be on the schools and the excitement, the excitement that we're getting a group together and, and the town can be involved and, and really, really put the emphasis on the schools. Because we have the library, we have the community center, and we have the schools. And to me, the schools are the very, very, very most important. So I hope there's not too much hype about the community center. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. This is for open space, correct? All right. Yeah, just so you know, we're an open space committee. <coughs> Any other public comment? No? Okay. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the council. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Discussion? Yes. Councilor Hamill. This is a good idea. Uh, I think these are definitely the, the groups to pull together to help uh, provide insight uh, to the efforts of that committee. So, uh, you know, I think they'll add a lot of value, but a good idea. Yes, Councilor yeah, Anderson. I think it's great, too. Just remind me, Karen, I don't, I don't know if this is within the charge of the committee, but 
something that I've been thinking lately is with the Harmon Dairy that's for sale, that's like 20 acres of land. Is part of their charge going to be looking at potential, you know, lots of land that, you know, the town would want to be able to purchase in the event that they ever sold? Like that's like a good example of a farm place that, you know, decided to sell that we, we can't predict, but are we looking holistically at not just like what's out there and available in green today, but what we would maybe want to purchase? Because I feel like that's a lost opportunity for the town because we don't have the land acquisition dollars where I think that would qualify to purchase it. And it's just, to me, it's this, that could have helped with conservation. It could help with recreation. And so not only is this important, but we've also been talking about we need to up the land acquisition fund as well at some point. And so I know that's been something that Karen's brought to finance that I think this might have to happen first, but you know, I hope that's I think my comments during finance and I didn't yeah. really get a response was if we're doing the open space plan, should we be, you know, kind of waiting to see what the land acquisition what we would want for that fund? Um, I mean, I, I I wish Autumn was here, but I think my understanding is, I mean, first we're going to evaluate what we already have, right. what we could, I, I'm, I'm going off here, but I'm saying, I think, I, I would hope they're going to then evaluate private properties that yes. maybe are conserved, yes. then I, those should be included. And then I think that I would imagine naturally the next step is where else can we conserve? Because to me, this right. is, you know, in response to let's slow down growth. Okay, well, let's conserve some more land so we can't grow on it. Mm -hmm. um, I know Harmon's land has been on and off the market for years and years. Um, I think there's a lot of issues with it. It's not very, there's not a lot of connectivity there. It's not very accessible and it's very overpriced right now. Mm -hmm. So there was an offer on it that, you know, I think, and I don't, I haven't heard anything on it though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Does the council have a liaison to this committee? Oh yeah. Do we have one okay. official? Yeah. That was officially. It is me. It was. Oh, okay. I think it is. Right. Okay. I just wanted to double check and make sure. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Show that it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next is order number 24 012, act on the request to approve the charge for the school building committee, phase one. Uh, so, this is part of um, our commitment to get back to work on trying to find a solution for our schools. Um, and I'm going to actually invite who I see is Chairperson Lindstrom from the school board here just to um, maybe help us understand um, your process over at the Board of Education. And this, I believe, was approved in the format that you see here this evening. Yes. Yeah. So the school board and, and just the general idea, folks, was that joint uh, committee, basically the school board and the um, town council working hand in hand on, on getting the solution um, figured out. So uh, anything you'd like to add from the meeting that you had with your board members regarding um, this advisory committee and the draft and the charge, perhaps? Um, not much outside of what I've already said. I will tell you that the board as a whole is very excited that the town council is interested in partnering and willing to um, step up and own this with us. Um, as we've said multiple times and you've said as well, this is really an a issue for our entire community and not just the school board. So thank you for considering it. Um, I, I think that Nick has done a good job of laying this out. It would be um, in phases. So this would be phase one where we would ask the committee to really look through and come forward with a solution, look through the data that is currently existing and come forward with the solution. Phase two would be actually implementing that and getting it ready for referendum. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Shannon. Um, with that, we do actually have an opportunity for public comment. Seeing none, uh, I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. And motion and second discussion. Um, I want to just say thank you, um, Shannon and April and uh, Jillian. All you know, we had an opportunity to sit and meet and try to work through a charge and how this could function together and. Um, and also, I'm going to throw a shout out to Cape Elizabeth for oh, helping, right. <laughs> for right. having gone through this a few months prior to us and helping set some of the groundwork up that we could build off of. So I think this is a great solution. I, I would point out that, um, you know, this is a you know, a nine person advisory board. Uh, five, five members are coming from the community, two from the BOE, two from the council. Um, but in the general broader sense, the whole building committee is comprised of anyone that wants to serve. And I yeah. think 
That's important. Um, so what we're what we're saying is we want the public there, and not only that, we want you to be uh, part of the leadership behind this, the driver. So uh, I look forward to to seeing this come to fruition. Um, any questions, comments on what's being proposed? Mm -hmm. Yes, Councilor nice Cushing. I would just put in a plug. Um, I think we've been waiting on council approval to roll out the official application. Um, so for the communities from their standpoint, um, the application is very short questionnaire um, asking to confirm your availability and your commitment to the committee. Um, and then, um, you know, giving us your name and contact information so that we can follow up with anyone who's interested to set that first meeting date. And that will be rolling out in the school uh, materials in their e-newsletter and potentially in a separate email. They have that, that capability to do that. And Allison is aware and um, is going to help the communications committee with a communications plan around making sure that we generate townwide um, accessibility to the application. Absolutely. And the school is prepared. School board is prepared to go forward with that um, pending approval tomorrow. I did have one, one question about... Um, the application process. I mean, it looks like it's sort of name, address, and mm -hmm. I'm interested. So assuming that you get way more applicants than you have slots for, uh, the community might be interested in what the selection criteria are. And I'm curious myself. Sure. Um, actually, the um, previous uh, building steering committee, their recommendation was to actually not limit, not have slots. So anybody who is interested in joining the building committee would join the building committee. As long as they can, um, they are a Scarborough resident, they are willing to commit time to attending the meetings and, and willing to serve and commit time to a subcommittee. As long as those three answers are yes, yes, and yes, then you're, you're eligible to serve on the committee. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Question, any other further questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? I'm sure that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Now the real fun starts. Uh, so as, as plugged by April and Shannon, uh, you will see uh, applications. We are now accepting all sorts of applications. Uh, that we, we, we are encouraging the town to take a really, you know, the community members take a prominent role in this, in this process with us. Um, it's, it's important for our entire community. So uh, that will be going out. And then uh, I guess I'll update it towards the end on uh, some survey some survey data that we'll be reaching for here shortly. So uh, next item is uh, non-action items. Do we have any? No. Great. Uh, item 10, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Who wants to start off with some reports? April. Communications committee. Uh, we met on January 10th. And just like always, we discussed our standing business, which is to assign Councilor Corner articles. Uh, the committee uh, discussed the options of having uh, Jean Marie write something for February 1st uh, and give the community a cannabis update. What? I'm just <laughs> hearing about this. You are, but I feel like, <laughs> but I feel like it's, it's, you get two weeks. Um, and I know that you're quick to turn around an article, but I feel like given the discussion we had tonight, given the discussion we had at ordinance, um, Councilor Anderson made the suggestion that that might be really timely for February 1st, um, and the committee agreed with that recommendation. So if you are available to do that, that would be fantastic. Yes, and then um, February 15th, uh, Nick, we had talked about you doing one as chair and to give the community an overview of our 2024 goals, Yes. Um, because our goal session will have um, yep. you know, been on the 29th or 28th. Um, and then other communication committee updates um, on the 25th, which is next Thursday, live, um, our first of the quarter, our first quarter rather of the year will be kicking off um, at 6 p.m. at the Public Safety Building. I am actually not facilitating this session. Uh, John Anderson and Don Cushing have volunteered to facilitate the session. Um, we're going a little bit off from our standard format, which is just kind of have the public come and um, not really have an agenda to being a little more structured. And I'm gonna let John speak to it because he's kind of been more into the planning of this, but I did wanna put the date out there um, next Thursday, the 25th at 6 p.m. at the Public Safety Building. Um, and then that night, because I have a conflict, um, I will just as a general announcement be going to um, Chairs and Circles, which is hosted by GP Cog. So that's what I'll be up to that night. 
Thank you, April. Uh, Councilor Ed? So just to add on the Councilor Corner Live piece, so we're having two facilitators who are gonna volunteer to facilitate it for us. So really Don and I will just be welcoming people and saying goodbye. I would encourage every counselor, if you're available to come, uh, again, if there's a big showing, they're gonna probably do some small group exercises and they would really like it if both a board member and a, a counselor could be available to sit at the tables. And again, our, our job is to listen, not necessarily to fully participate in the conversation. So they're gonna have some structured guiding questions that they're gonna ask the different um, tables to essentially answer that I think will give us some information that could really go probably to the committee um, that we just agreed to form to say, here's some feedback that we got from these residents, a precursor to a survey that would just kind of, again, give a starting point for conversation. Um, John, in our excitement, we forgot to mention that the topic of Counselor Corner Live is the school project. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seeking yeah. a school solution yeah. is, is what we're talking about. So any and all options, any and all ideas, it's going to be like John said, a workshop environment where we discuss the problem statements that the community sees, the problem statements that have been discussed um, at a committee level, and kind of bring those together to see what the community has to bring sort of some solutions. So I, I should have set that up a little yeah. bit more. <laughs> and I would add to that that we are planning this and doing this uh, jointly with the school committee. And it's sort of a, I guess, a warm up to the uh, real show which is uh, the committee uh, process that we just approved to do jointly. And if people out there who are still up and watching, you know, want to come and get a preview of what being on that committee might be like, this would be a good way to find out. Yep. So just some other quick updates for finance. We met last week and we reviewed and met with uh, the Scarborough Land Trust and town staff to talk about um, guidance we wanted them to do to help us with the financial analysis to look at the potential leasing of Alger Hall to Scarborough Land Trust. So staff is going to be working on that. Uh, we looked at the budget process and I provided um, a draft based on our discussion to the finance committee to look at to make sure that some of those dates work for you guys. I think Tom wants to try and get that, get the dates booked now. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, if you could, and just let me know. Um, we're, we're likely going to front load um, taking taking a, a a learning from the school board where they kind of have two days of half day workshops to kind of review the budget. We're going to try and do the same thing early in the process so that way we can spend more time as a committee um, digging in, making recommendations, being able to to work with the council if there's any specific comments. So we're we're kind of mixing things up a little bit this year. Um, we also started to have a conversation around the council financial goal, which will bring as a discussion point to the workshop. It'll be a recommendation. So council can obviously debate it and we can change it when we're there. The challenge we were trying to, to contend with based on Nick being here tonight is typically we focus so much on the 3% mill rate increase, but because it's a reval year, that's not a good metric. So what is a good metric that we want to hold as a, as a barometer for us to kind of work through the budget. And so we'll have a recommendation. Um, we also, looked at the calendar we set for the year and some things that were mentioned tonight that I know are of interest that I had, had said already. Um, we're going to talk about cost to serve, the downs analysis. Those are some of the upcoming things. We're also going to start digging into our fiscal policy. We're going to take that in chunks to really kind of do a thorough review this year. Um, the Maple Ave meeting, I think Liam mentioned, was moved to Wednesday next week at 630. It was because of the weather. We had to cancel it. And so Councillor Cushing and I, I believe, are planning to attend just to be present and um, work with staff and the residents to see what the next steps are. Um, the policy is pretty good. It's still draft. Uh, I don't know if everybody, I think everybody was on the email that Angela sent that had it. So if you, if you had a chance to read it, go ahead and read it. But it's going to go through a process and get more vetted. So, you know, I wouldn't spend too much time on it, but it's a pretty good, good document. So I have. Council Hamill. I had a question. On the trigger. I had a question about the uh, the Maple Ave folks. What does the the acronym stand for that they go by? TM something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was listed on the count cal calendar as like mm -hmm. some acronym that someone asked, and I was like, I don't know what that is. Okay. <laughs> no, it's someone in response. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the location. It's been a long week. It's been a long week. <laughs> That's the question of the night. Councilor Katarina. Yeah, very quickly. Um, Maine Municipal uh, Legislative Policy Committee. I get to sit in front of Zoom for six hours tomorrow. Wish me luck. I'll report back on anything that's legislative that uh, may impact Scarborough. I know there's a, a few things out there dangling that I'm like looking at going, uh. Um, community cen uh, Center, I can't even talk anymore. The advisory <laughs> committee met the other night and um, I know that we, uh, Karen Shoup and I and Tom Hall met with Todd regarding we need to slow this down. Um, they did agree, and I, I need to find out what the process is, and I'm looking at Liam, is something else for you to look into for me, as to the original um, uh, uh, order they had to work under was they had to be wrapped up by, I forget what it was, the end of May or beginning of June or something, while well, it's gonna be extended into July, and they're gonna meet once every three weeks. And what they're doing basically is coming up with this is what the basics of what a community center should look like and you know the square footage and maybe some preliminary costs but uh we did talk um was it last night i can forget what nights i have these meetings but we talked about um the fact that the school comes first so you know i don't want anyone out there thinking we're going to be pushing the community center at this point <laughs> because uh, we need to take care of the school, but we do want to have something in place. The folks we have in this committee are very talented. The uh, consultants are really good. So let's get something pulled together so that we're ready to hop when we can hop. So that's, uh, I think that's all I had to report on at this point. Thanks. Thank you. Karen. So the Appointments and Negotiation Committee met last week and we went through all of the appointments that were up in the vacancies that we had. So at this point, I'm going to read in um, the recommendations as a first read, if everyone can bear with me for a couple of minutes here. So first we have the Board of Assessment of Review and we're recommending to reappoint Christopher Herrick as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2026. We have the Community Services Advisory Board recommending to reappoint Patricia Brigham and Emily Loader as full voting members with terms to expire in 2026. On the Conservation Commission, we're recommending to reappoint Randy Hogan as a full voting member, move Kathleen Miller from the first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2025, and move Abel Plaud from the second alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2024, appoint Bennett Flanders as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2026, and appoint Lauren Johnston as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2026. We have the Housing Alliance Committee, where we are recommending to reappoint Robert Nato as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2026 and appoint Bill Shanahan as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2026. We have the Parks and Conservation Land Board. We're recommending to reappoint Richard Murphy and Jessica Sargent as full voting members with terms to expire in 2026. We have the Personnel Board of Appeals. We're recommending to reappoint Jennifer Beattie and Denise Smith as full voting members with terms to expire in 2026 and appoint Penny Whitney as Dorian as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2026. We have the planning board and we're recommending to reappoint Roger Bailey as a full voting member and oh, with a term to expire in 2026 and Bennett Flanders as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2026. We have the sustainability committee and we're recommending to reappoint Jay Anton Boder as a full voting member and Patrice Kastenholtz as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2026. We have the Transportation Committee. We're re recommending to reappoint Thomas Barclay as a full voting member and Craig Robinson as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2026. And finally, we have the Zoning Board of Appeals. We're recommending to reappoint Michelle Stevenson as a full voting member and Joseph Doherty as the second alternate with a term to expire in 2026. <laughs> Sounds like you've done some work. <laughs> and we still have vacancies and things like that. So please. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. No? Um, yeah, just one quick thing. I sure. will be attending the uh, board meeting for Eco Maine uh, tomorrow. Um, it's fun going over there because it's uh, a business I can actually understand. Um, <laughs> and and uh, they are uh, looking for approval on a $30 million bond to uh, replace the um, sorting facility that they have there for the recycling. And uh, I spent time with uh, 
the CEO, Kevin, and uh, I was pretty impressed with uh, his understanding of this business and his long-term capital planning and his rationale for um, for moving this big bond issue forward. So I will support it unless somebody calls me between uh, now and uh, four o'clock tomorrow and gives me a compelling reason not to. Thank you. Uh, Councilor comments. Tapped out for the evening. We've got an executive session to work through. All right. So uh, I, I think I just, um, yeah, let's just get, get on with it. Order number 24013, act on the request for an executive session to, pursuant to Title I, subsection 405.6A, regarding the town manager's performance evaluation. Uh, this is a yearly um, occurrence and Go ahead. Point, yeah. of, point of order. Um, should the should the motion read not to return to regular session? Yes. Okay. Okay. No, Thank you. Door. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> so we're all good. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, all in favor. All right. So that is unanimous. Thank you all for staying with us at home. Um, hope you learned some stuff tonight. Feel free to reach out.